Traveling the Vortex. We've joined the Doctor as he travels the Vortex and arrive at episode number 342. And remember, a meteorologist is a respectable profession. I'm Keith. I'm Sean. I'm Glenn. And I'm Andy. Welcome, Andy. How are you guys? Yay! Hey, hello! Doing well, Keith. Doing well. <laughs> you threw me, Glenn. You threw me. <laughs> I, had, I, wait. I had to get it in there. Yeah, I know. That's because Sean was waiting. I had to say it. I could drive a truck through that pause. Thanks. That's an edit. I got to do that. <laughs> have you guys had a good week? Oh, what have I done this Mostly. week? Mostly. We've, uh, we're recording a bit earlier than normal, so Andy can join us. Hello. Sorry, at at a respectable hour. Yeah, yeah, really. For all daytime of us, really. Still. Well, <laughs> quarter eight at night, but still basically daytime out there, so yay. No lights need to be switched on. It's cool. Not yet. By the time we're Not done, yet. it'll be dark in there. Yeah. So I've got a light switch here, see? Ah, there we so, go. Oh, okay. there we go. <laughs> I'm in my cupboard. <laughs> no, it's just, it is actually a cupboard. <laughs> Most people it's say like, workspace. You're just honest. No, it's actually like Harry Potter. I'm like in the cupboard under the stairs. <laughs> it's fantastic. But, See, and that's uh, another UK thing because you say cupboard here, and I think in my kitchen I have cupboards. Okay. So here, here it's a closet. Well, I, so in the kitchen there's still cupboards. Right. Huh. Okay. Or cabinets. Or cabinets. Cupboards or cabinets. Okay. All right, then. Yeah, I'm in the kitchen. Well, since we're going there, the <laughs> cupboards are the ones on the floor level. The cabinets there are the go. ones up high. Really? And, that's a, and that's different than a pantry, which that's is what we've always well, grown up. No, pantry, we, we have pantries, too. So, okay. That's interesting. <laughs> I'll make, we don't call that larder at all. No? No. I never heard that phrase until I started watching Doctor Who. Oh, <laughs> Doctor Who is a, it's the great educational. <laughs> often in how not to write good stories. Everything I know about the reign of terror, I know from Doctor Who. <laughs> Do you know, I have so like, much culture because of this show. <laughs> it is true. I mean, I, as a kid, like yourself, I'm sure, I learned a lot of history just from Doctor Who. And that's a relearn history when you suddenly realize they took a few liberties. Yeah. I'm still learning history from Doctor Who. I'm, and well, not bothering to relearn it. Well, you know, <laughs> history is certainly more fun than real history. Let's yeah. be honest, you know. Do you guys, uh, do you guys do anything this week? <laughs> I, How about I'm you, gonna, Sean? I'm going to tip my hat. After Friday Night Who... I had to boot up Mystery Science Theater, The Return, on Netflix, and I watched Reptilicus because I was in the some, mood for something good. So, <laughs> that was that. How was that? It was better than Friday Night. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to that later. But we'll get to that later. Um, no, I, I really didn't do much. Mel's out of town. Uh, she's in Cincinnati for a uh, pure romance conference. They're doing their uh, the world concert. She's getting all kinds of training, and we keep managing to not contact each other which has kind of been frustrating but she's supposed to be home at some point tomorrow so so you haven't spent your bachelor week binging something or anything um i watched kung fury which i didn't i'd been kind of holding on to that one because i'd heard it was amazing it's a this movie that's basically made in front of a green screen and it's designed to look like an 80s movie uh about a cop who gets thrown back in time and uh, encounters uh, laser raptors and then fights Hitler with Kung Fu. I didn't realize it was only half an hour long, so then all of a sudden it was like, why haven't I watched this yet? So I popped it in and, wow, let me tell you, it's as amazing as why. It <laughs> no, it's as amazing as it sounds. <laughs> I mean, it's bad. Don't get me wrong. It is bad. But, yeah, the, the audacity of it was like, okay, you, you guys are good in my book. Hmm. Okay. But yeah, no. Other than that, I haven't uh, I haven't done much. I've been I've been I've been editing. I've been doing a lot of a uh, lot, lot of writing. So, I'm Glenn, you, Glenn, did you watch anything? No, not really. Um, I popped in. Uh, well, on uh, CNN's app, they've got the history of comedy, which is actually pretty good. If anybody hasn't seen it yet, it it goes topical. It starts with women of comedy. It talks about. Uh, racism and comedy and things like that. And I think there's like five episodes on there now, but it's it's pretty interesting, pretty funny. 
Sounds good. I haven't done anything either. I'll be watching I... some uh, Trout Network, and that's about it. All I've been doing is work. Oh, look, look, look. This is what I've been doing this past week. I haven't gone very far of it, but this is what I've been doing this week, other than editing the thing I sent you guys short earlier, which you can't talk about just yet. Um, <laughs> Spoilers. Um, I have also been writing this in the past week. <gasps> We're looking at the uh, Lost Skin episode three, so yeah, the cover page three. anyway. Chapter one. Ooh. Okay, if you could just and, hold it there for just a second. Oh, one second. <laughs> well, we we'll grab a screen know, cap. Hang on. Charlie gets knocked over, yeah. as we know, at the back by somebody who may or may not be uh, Gregor. Right. And then, of course, the next scene. It's a completely disconnected scene because it's not as fun to tell you straight where he where is. <laughs> Curse you. <laughs> But, 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 and you can't read this out, guys, but you can see it on the cam. But this will show you here. Uh, oops. Uh, uh. <gasps> <gasps> oh. Can you see? Yes. Oh. Now you know who knocked him out. <laughs> <laughs> and I will admit that was always the plan. Oh. I didn't change it until nice. later. Nice. But there's a host. Oh, and it this way is not fun. Okay, now <laughs> that's a, that's for later as well, if you like. Yeah, you can't you can't release that soon enough for me now. Well, hopefully it lives up to uh, expectations. <laughs> All right, well let's let's go ahead and do some news of the week, and then we can get right into our discussion with Andy. Okay. Yeah. So uh, not a lot of news this week. Uh, apparently, Moffat has been talking and admits that there almost wasn't a Christmas special, and the fact that uh, he wanted to leave after series ten. And Chris Chibnall did not want to start with Christmas, and so they were just going to skip it. And then Moffat decided, all right, I'll do Christmas. And then he had to persuade Peter to do Christmas. So they kind of, I guess, had to rework some things to make it work. The impression I I get anyways. I kind of wish they had skipped it and just made the finale the finale and then started fresh a year later instead of having this in-between piece. In hindsight, it kind of explains a little bit about the the tonality of the last episode that it doesn't quite feel like it mm. and not, not that i've seen it of course but i will agree with you yes <laughs> <laughs> i will watch it honestly i was gonna wait till it's very cheap because uh... <sighs> well from a Less, uh... from a uk perspective since you're over yeah. there would that be weird i mean we've had what 11 years now of christmas specials doctor who's been on christmas day for the last 11 years uh, would that be weird is... not to have doctor who at christmas um i imagine there would be a heck of a lot of doctor who fans of here would definitely say yes i don't know if it'd be weird for me personally no because there has been occasions where i've just not been that interested in watching it until watching it when I feel like it, but that's purely just as you know because I'm getting I've been a bit burned out by it all lately. But I, I think most people will probably find it a bit odd now because it has become kind of a fixture, which is obviously a good thing. But I don't know. I don't know if it wouldn't be weird for me. But speaking for the UK, because I am the only person from the UK here, I think it probably would be a little bit weird for the UK at large because. One thing I do love, as much as I rail against a lot of New Who, one thing I do love, it happened yesterday too, I was in Cardiff, and these teenage boy I say teenage, so it's probably, possibly early 20s, I don't know, but they're all there, walk, just walking past, dressed like some were like people who like new metal, some people, you know, proper mixture of teenagers here, and they're all walking past, talking about Doctor Who, and I'm like, that's kind of cool, you know, because obviously that's the generation that started watching New Who. Right. Who are right. now at the stage when they're like in their twenties now, so it's good. And I think, yeah, if it didn't happen, it probably would put a lot of people off. If, if they were to skip a Christmas, they should have skipped last Christmas and just not done Doctor Mysterio. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm glad. You, I'm glad you didn't invite me on for that because. <laughs> oh, I haven't rewatched that one at all. I haven't even and rewatched I've, that one. I, I don't. Yeah, I've not even rewatched the uh, Husbands of River Song. Actually, to be fair, I do have it on DVD, but I haven't rewatched it because I'm like, yeah, it didn't work for me. Oh, that's too bad. That was good. Uh, that one worked better for me than yeah. Doctor Mysterio. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
It was, yeah. Yeah, let's not go. Yeah, yeah. Let's be, let's be positive. We've already covered well, that. I think I, I, the only reason I ask is because Doctor Who's such an institution over there. But I think even yeah. over here, I think fans here would miss it too because I think it's 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 one of those shows that I think people, even if you're not a Doctor Who fan, people are, are consciously aware that, hey, you know, it's Christmas, Doctor Who's going to be on mm-hmm. tonight. And I think there's a lot of occasions where families sit down and watch, and, you know, grandparents and parents that don't necessarily watch the series sit down and watch those episodes on Christmas. So I, I think it would be missed, uh, even yeah, by the, the non fans. I'm not sure now. It's certainly true for the first eight years, maybe, of New Who. But I don't know if it's been true, certainly, of last year and going to be this year where people are necessarily sitting down to watch because one thing has been quite clear this year is that Doctor Who is not really watched as live like it used to be. Right. Because, I mean, you know there's obviously discussion about viewing figures and da-da-da-da. And people are beginning to realise finally that the viewing figures don't really matter so much anymore because, just like most TV, it's not watched as live anymore because of the whole Netflix generation. You can just watch it when you feel like it. And I I suspect that's true of Christmas too. That's probably certainly. True. But certainly of my family, because as I'm sure you can imagine, if you're in my family, you kind of have no choice but like Doctor Who, because hi, <laughs> <laughs> it's, just the, it's just the man I am. Um, and last couple of years, there's been no impetus to sit down and watch it like we would have done before. So not that I'm necessarily talking for everybody. I imagine, though, that the past couple of years, it's been less of a event to be watched at the time. But I might well, be wrong. It's become so much easier to watch it in other means now. Absolutely. Like time delayed, it's so much easier. Yeah. And so you can base Doctor Who around your Christmas events. Absolutely, which I think is a good thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I suppose on the downside, it does lose the um, the whole idea of, well, not Christmas so much, but generally of being at work and a couple of days later and you're all talking about it because not everybody would have watched it. And then, right. of course... We get into the old social media spoilers because, so you know, I've not seen it yet. It's like, well, you know, it's been two days. Whose fault's that? Right. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, or and then and then or worse. Well, I'm. It's actually quite funny because, as you may have noticed, I've got really annoyed with people. Literally, it's on that night, and they're all talking about it with a proper spoiling it. And I'm like, guys, come on, let at least the Americans watch it first. Because you know, you guys get it the day after. I think it is uh, same day, but we like get it six same day, but later. it's yeah, about six, six, well, or eight hours six later. hours make that yeah. sense. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it's like give them a chance just to at least enjoy it themselves first. That's but then they, how I felt about like the announcement with uh, I'm about to say Richard Herndl <laughs> with David Bradley. <laughs> I mean, stuff. yeah. I I they released that, and I happened to be on social media at the wrong time. Yeah, I remember you saying yeah, but it could be worse. They could oh, have told yeah. you that the master was in it before the season was even shown. I mean, <laughs> oh, imagine oh, what happened. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Some of it's us like are still I, angry over that, Andy. It's like me. I can tell you that in the sixth book this year, we're doing this. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you guys, though. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Part of me kind of wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying nothing. You don't You don't even know what the titles are the next half of the year, do you? No. That's cool. No, nope. we don't. There's some fun stuff coming. <laughs> what else, Keith? Uh the Goodreads Book Club have selected the next book. So the August book has been chosen as Doctor Who: A Brief History of Time Lords. Okay. You can pick that up and jump in the discussion on our Good our uh, Goodreads Book Club group. And then our other bit of news comes from Andy himself. Oh, I have news. I you do have news. I have news. Um, okay, basically, for your UK listeners, especially if you happen to be in South Wales a week Thursday, so basically Thursday the 17th, throughout that week in Cardiff, Candy Jar is holding a book festival, which will have loads of different events, loads of authors on the haze. If you're a UK Cardiffy type person, you'll know what the haze is. If you don't, it's easy to find. It's pretty central. Um, sp- specifically, on the 17th, which is Thursday, we're having a bit of a left with Stuart day. And on the 11 o'clock, I believe, I hope I'm right because it's me, um, will be there signing books, apparently. And we'll have Simon Forward also and a few others who will be there because we've got an official meeting for next year, um, which I can't tell you about. Um, 
and then later on at one o'clock in the um, Story Museum, I believe it's called, which is the old library, we've got a panel of, again, the Left Stuart authors talking about Left Stuart, talking about short stories and various other things, which will lead us into announcing, which is very important, which you guys are going to like too, and a lot of people are going to like, our new short story competition, because every few years we hold the South Wales short story competition. This year, it's specifically going to be targeted at Leftbridge Stewart. Oh. So you, as every year, every, every few years, you pay your entry fee, you submit your story, gets edited, blah, blah, and the, the winner will win something or other. I think you'd get three winners, or possibly maybe two, I forget. But this year, one of them, the first prize, I think it's two, but certainly the first, first one is the winner will get a contract to write a Left for Stewart novel slash novella, depending on the story, of course. Um, so it, basically the um, pitch is going to be any story that features Left for Stewart. It doesn't need to be part of our canon. It could be a, literally any kind of what ifs. So you can, so you don't need to have read our stuff to write a story, as long as it's not Doctor Who, of course. So it's kind of like what people have been asking, when's your next open submission window? So this is kind of it. But it costs you to enter because there's a prize to win, and everybody who gets picked, all the finalists, will get into a... I don't have a copy of the last one here, unfortunately. No. Um, it will get into a volume printed of all the finalist stories as well but the winners then the winner will get his contract or her contract plus i think it's two runners up oh, that's so cool. that's, that's coming really cool. up in a week thursday so news. very cool so yeah if you're, if you're in the area be about. sure to uh look it yeah. up because that'll be yeah absolutely i wish i was there uh, see, I, I didn't get my invite in the mail, so that must have... Uh, oh, yeah, man. See, you could have been assigned this thing. I totally would have come down and You'd signed that. Assigned thing. this, yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> your, your name is on, like, almost every page, it seems. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Look. It's on the copyright page. It's there. It's... Your fingerprints are all over this. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> more so than people realize, I think. <laughs> well, more than you don't realize now. Hey, anyway, now, 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 who's being embarrassed? <laughs> well, yeah, you did it to me last week, so I think you know, Kirk Street is not three, as Sylvester McCoy once said. Uh, all right, Keith, what do you think? Should we move on to feedback real quick? I'm, I'm chomping yeah. up to you uh, to uh, talk. Let's to move Andy, on so. to feedback. Our first and only bit of feedback this week comes from Kirk. That's the guy that lives nearby, right? Uh, yeah. yeah sorry. Hey, see, I follow you guys. Not yeah. down the street, but nearby. Well, nearby. Closer than me. A lot closer oh, yes. than you. <laughs> <laughs> Kirk writes, hello again. I haven't sent feedback in for a while, so I'll comment on Colony in Space and the conclusion of Season 10. I was happy to join Friday Night Who the past few weeks. The new earlier time is welcome. I've also sprung for a subscription to BritBox, which gives me access to more classic series stories. Unfortunately, Colony in Space didn't do a great job of holding my attention. No six-parter is going to make it into the favorable stories lists when the most interesting thing in it is an abundance of glorious 70s facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kirk. <laughs> Even Roger Delgado couldn't elevate the later episodes to more, more than a plod. Uh, I admit I was distracted during the second half because I was also texting with a charming lady. I was going to say she's auditioning to be my companion, and the audition will involve her screaming and running through corridors, but I decided that would make me sound like a serial killer. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> may have, Kirk. You more, Kirk. Yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> I may have to stick him in the next book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Moving on. Season 10 started and ended strong with a wobble in the middle, but I think it's the best Capaldi season by far. Oxygen was top-notch. Extremis was engaging. Just don't think about it too much. The next two episodes were the weakest, in my opinion. Peter Harness's script simply missed the mark for me, and the Doctor's fake out of Bill in Lie of the Land bothers me more and more as time passes. Empress of Mars was a nice diversion and a better-than-average outing for writer Mark Gatiss. 
I also thought The Eaters of Light was a pleasant story. I was enchanted enough by the location and cinematography to overlook the lightweight plot. <laughs> Extremes. <laughs> Extremist. <laughs> I got that one right. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> Pass Mahatan. Yeah, sorry, Kurt. All right. Carry on. <laughs> the two part finale was very well done, with World Enough and Time being the stronger of the two parts. Like everyone, I wish I hadn't been spoiled by the BBC on the appearance of the Mondasian Spiberman and John Spiberman? Sim. Spiberman. What's a Spiberman? Spiberman, you know. It's a Cyberman who was bitten by a radioactive fiber. <laughs> and he swing from a web. No, he no, can't. He can't. He's a cyber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. This is going to be one podcast. <laughs> I'm going to play with my TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs> Sim completely fooled me with his disguise. Even I, though I went, uh, <laughs> even <laughs> I have to mute anyone now. <laughs> Getting visuals here. <laughs> uh, even though I suspected during the pilot that Heather would show up in the season finale, I don't think Bill got a proper send off. I'm glad that she'll be back for the Christmas special and hope for a more satisfying resolution. I read recently that Moffat explained that Dr. Falls to be his last episode, expected the Dr. Falls to be his last episode, and had a particular conclusion planned. <laughs> then he and Capaldi had to step in to do the Christmas special so that Dr. Who wouldn't lose its spot in schedule in future years. I think that explains some of what I find lacking with Dr. Falls. Seems like he was leading up to a big moment and then had to hold back and delay until the Christmas special. But that said, I'm all in for Twice Upon a Time. It has the makings of a terrific story. I predict that in the end, 1 plus 12 will leave us with 13. Seems like a safe bet. Gotta go. I gotta have to practice running through corridors. In other words, I have a date. Catch <laughs> you next time in the Vortex, Kirk. <laughs> Thanks, Kirk. Have fun on your date. Enjoy your date, Kirk. We were paying complete attention to <laughs> Sorry, guy. How many I'll have to admit, for those those listening. How many tardises do flying, you have? I was just flying tardises past the camera with uh, Millennium Falcon. I've got three. I, I kind of sort of have an additional piece of feedback. Uh, a friend of mine texted, and I let him know, I'm sorry, I can't talk. We're recording the podcast with a guest from the UK. And he says, can you get them to say bloody snookums? Who says that? I don't know. <laughs> Thinks that's a very big thing in uh, in England. Bloody snookums. Not to my knowledge. Bloody that? yes, snookums. Not so much. But I'll do it just for him. <clears throat> I'll do it well, shall I? Okay. Bloody snookums. There, <laughs> there we go. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, he's found their episode title. Never let it be said that we. <laughs> <laughs> Never snook- let it be said. We don't give our listeners what they want. <laughs> Bloody Snookums is now the episode title. That is exactly what it is. <laughs> Still, could be worse. Could be like um, in Buffy Land. I'm sure you guys are fans of Buffy, where um, Spike constantly says "poof." Yes. You know, yeah. Which I am pretty sure. That um, Anthony Stewart head didn't correct him on that deliberately, just so people know that James Masters wasn't English, because there's no English guy would have got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot better. I can always imagine Anthony Stewart going, <laughs> "Don't know, don't you worry." <laughs> <laughs> when I watched, it, I had no idea he was American. I yeah, just he does such a good accent. American, so, you know, so. Although, from, admittedly, early on, it's not as good as it is later. He gets a lot better well, at it. Absolutely. It gets it, it relaxes a lot because it begin it's quite the usual American version of the English accent, but towards yeah. the end it's much more natural. I think more time spends with Anthony Stewart head probably actually. Except for when he sings. Yeah, then he goes. Actually, I like that he loses it a little bit there. It's a good song, but he kind of loses the accent. Yes, he don't get me talking about Buffy, man. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> that's another podcast. <laughs> that's not so. Well, uh, of course, you can send us feedback by going to our website, travelingthevortex.com, and fill out the Send Us Feedback tab. Or you can send it directly to feedback at travelingthevortex.com. Time for our review of Colony in Space. 
The Time Lords discovered that the Master has stolen a secret, so stolen secret information about a device called the Doomsday Weapon, and realized they need the exiled Doctor's help. They send the TARDIS along with the Doctor and his assistant Joe Grant to the bleak planet Uraxius. Was that right? Oh, see now I can't remember now. In the middle of the 25th century, where all is not well. What is attacking the colonists, and can the Doctor stop his old enemy from finding the dangerous weapon before it is too late? Dun, dun, dun. Well, that came from Andy. I know, that was as much enthusiasm as I could. <laughs> <Buster. laughs> Alright, Sean, let's give it the real dun-dun-dun. Go on, Sean, do your version. <clears throat> So yeah, Colin Space. Huh? Um, well, <laughs> uh, let me go first because I don't Lynn think seems like he's disappointed. We're all no, I'm I'm not it. disappointed because I can recognize that this isn't. It's not the best of the Pertwier. I I wouldn't even put it up there as the best of the Pertwier. I wouldn't put it close to the best of the Pertwier. <laughs> Which is the but best I, for you? I, uh, I like. I think the Demons is probably my favorite of the Pertwies. Um. An opinion. Up there would be, I, and I think I'm one of the few people that it's an opinion. I think I'm one of the few people that likes likes ambassadors too. Um, ambassadors this is, is surprisingly good. This one's not bad. I mean, there it's it. I think where it falls down is it. It is very stoic. There's not a lot going on, especially in those first three episodes. And I think by the time the master shows up, which we as fans that didn't see it the first time around, we know the master's coming because he's on the cover of the DVD. So yeah. for the master not to show up for those of us that know he's in it until three episodes into the thing is four, four, four. episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he shows up four. and it's not even four. It's almost four and a half. Cause it's like the middle. I think he shows up or the first or when he's revealed, I guess. We yeah. He wasn't, he, he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't even revealed at all. Yeah. It's, it's... And so, I mean, not that we we all knew his, his voice was the uh, uh, the arbiter, but well, yeah. yeah. You, yeah in fact, what, what, I think I pointed him. that out. So I wonder whose voice that is. But um, hmm. I don't think it's bad. I think it has some good ideas. And it was it Malcolm Hulk that wrote this one. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I I I think it's the, the issues are plotting. It's it's far too long for the ideas that are in it. And I think when you couple that with bad model work and the 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 makeup of the or the uh, prosthetics of the aliens are far <laughs> from good either and i think when you put all of those elements into one story it really does give it low marks but i think the the ideas in the story are that are there the battle or the struggle between the the colonists and the minus and, and miners minus my i make a made up i made up a word <laughs> miners um you know, it's intriguing because they're the, the miners are there for the the money element of it, and they want to mine the planet for the materials. And the colonists they're just trying to make a new start. And it's clear that the miners are trying to scare off the colonies, the colonists at first, and then it starts to become a next layer of you know where they're killing now suddenly they're killing miners in order to or a killing colonist in order to drive them off the planet and so i like the idea of that struggle and the doctor and joe i i think it would be better if the doctor and the, and joe sort of had arrived on accident i think the mm. the i think the idea of the time lords intervening and supplanting there is a little bit trite but i think overall i think the idea is good i agree glenn i think the the whole minor colonist plot is probably the stronger aspect of the story uh i i was i didn't find the first three parts that slow i thought i found them fairly engaging it's the last half where they shoehorn in it feels the entire story feels like it's two ideas this really cool idea of the master going after this doomsday weapon and this cool political satire or anal uh, analogy that and then they just tried to smish them together but not in the typical third doctor kind of smishing together of four parts two parts or like even split they try to mish them together more which i applaud them for trying to make them more interconnected than they are unfortunately it doesn't work <laughs> no. the the master alien subplot surprisingly for me was the more boring aspect of it 
because it's so simple that there's not much to it. It's the master showing up and then, okay, let's go get this doomsday weapon. And the doctor saying, no, no, we can't do it. It all felt forced and unnecessary. Great. Yeah. I, I, it's as with most of the Pertwee six parters, it's just, it's, it's quite simple. It's just too long. Um, if they could have found a better way to explore some of these stories, maybe it would have worked better. Um, but I, I agree. I think the, 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 the colonist, uh, issues that they're having, it was interesting, but I kind of, for the first part, cause we broke this up over, uh, over the two weeks for Friday night. Lucky we watched the you. first three episodes and then the second three. <laughs> Aren't you lucky? <laughs> but, One um, sit in. <laughs> wow. I, I, yeah. I don't yeah. know if I'd have made it. Oh, you know, great hair, man. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't there before yesterday. <laughs> exactly. I was like 20 yesterday. <laughs> I, I think the, the first part, while it was interesting enough, I just kind of sat there, all right, when are we going to... I mean, it, feel, it feels like an episode of Scooby-Doo. And not one of the good ones, but one of the ones where it's like, oh, you've got a special guest star this week. The Doctor and the Master are going to show up. Can you please hurry up and get to the punchline where he says, I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for these meddling kids. And then the second half, you're right. It's a completely different story. The, the super weapon just happens to be on this planet and the Master's there as normal trying to do his... Uh, and not connected to anything the miners are, or yeah. the colonists are doing. It's, it just, if, it just it had been, be if it had been one of those hard breaks in the stories... Like, if we would have gotten four parts of the miners, the miners had been resolved, and the master showed up at the end and bridged the gap, it would have probably been a superior story. It probably would have been better told. But the fact that we drag on the miner story far past the four parts that it needs. See, and the then, master, he's only there because he's meant to be there, because obviously it's the master season. And But that said, what you guys are saying about him coming later, I agree the whole your weight and your way you come on get to the actual interest and stuff which turns out not to be so much but i imagine back in the day watching it originally you had what four weeks almost off away from the master which must have been sort of refreshing for the viewers back then because they had had a master for at that point i believe it was 10 weeks straight yeah every every so story terror, of that and, season up to that yeah. point yeah yeah because at that point you had Tell the Autons and Mind uh, of Evil. So you've had that 10 weeks. It was a four and a six, straight. so yeah. yeah. And so four weeks off was probably quite nice. So I do wonder if back then they were expecting him to turn up or not. Because we obviously are, because you know, it's a long time ago, we know he's in it. But I'll say two good things about this story. And I'm really pushing myself here. Um, <laughs> I would agree with um, Keith that the first half of the story is more interesting to me. Second half is just, ugh, just goes nowhere. It's very, literally very gray and just drab and just boring and slow. Even but the, the action's first half, slow and boring. The action's slow. The fights is like, you could literally walk away and not get hit. It's just, you, know, <laughs> you, you missed me. You know, um, but the first half, what I do like, especially the first episode sets up really nicely is, this is Joe's first time in the TARDIS, which is really played kind of against type because she's quite scared by the idea of it when she arrives on Xarius, I think it's called. I may have got it wrong, that planet. Um, the planet of clay. Um, <laughs> she's quite scared about that, and that's kind of interesting because that's not typical for Doctor mm -hmm. Who at time, or even now, actually. And, you know, and of course, then you, you get the new TARDIS console room for the first time this season which is kind of cool as well. You know, the new console, which will be with him now until midway through Tom Baker's time, I think. Yeah. And But what you do get, which is kind of fun, but I don't think it's supposed to be. It's, but it's a plus point because it's just weird, is that when the TARDIS is dematerializing and when it comes back at the end, Ugh. it doesn't <laughs> fade away. It just, just you know, pops out of existence. What happened? Because it's, it's interesting... To me, anyway, that within the context of the season and indeed the year before, this is the first time the Vatatalis dematerialize since this new team took over. Um, and it's the first time they've gone to an alien planet since this new team took over. I don't mean the Doctor and John, I mean the production team. Right. And clearly, they kind of weren't too sure how to do this yet. How mm -hmm. to do alien planets, how to do the TARDIS in actuality. 
you know, prop, fine, but actually doing it technically, they clearly hadn't quite worked out yet. So it's, yeah, it's a pretty tedious story. But I actually commented last stuff. week. I, I wondered, uh, a friend of mine was over watching it, and he commented on the, oh, wow, the TARDIS disappearing. That was different. And I, I commented, I wonder if it was, they built that set of uh, the doctor's lab around the police box because, well, he's going to be here. And then suddenly a script came in that called for it to be somewhere else. And they looked around and realized they were going to have to knock out a wall to move it. I don't know, but that's kind of what it felt like. Is the, well, I don't know, uh, how do we get it out of here? I'm, I'd have to rewatch uh, Mind of Evil and Tell the Autons, but I am pretty sure there would have been a different lab because pretty much every time we saw his lab, it was different. That's yeah. true. Oh, that's that's what I yeah, that's story. absolutely right. Oh, by the end of his, his um, five-year run, it's sort of mixed mash of his various labs. Yeah. So, but, one you know, thing he, I, he, I really like the HQ. So, I really like the bookend of it, of the fact that they disappear and the Briggs come back <coughs> here, and then we come back and it's the Briggs saying the exact same line, and they haven't really left, but just well, disappeared and came back. That aspect of it was a, a really great. That's a good aspect, but I think it's good that there must have been at least a few seconds between them going and coming back, because otherwise the Brigadier would have got squashed. Because well, he yeah. literally <laughs> walks onto the spot the TARDIS is in the corner. Where are you, Doctor? What's going on? Next shot, he's at the end of the lab. Luckily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought the, I thought the you know. exact same thing, and I hadn't noticed that the first time I watched it. This time I thought, that's a different wall behind him when we come back at the end, and he's saying that again. Doctor, come back. Yeah. And I thought... Well, it's a good thing he moved from the spot he was standing. <laughs> well, if it's Apparently new, he needs to repeat just, himself. Yeah. If it's new, who it's materialized around him. But right. Back right. then, you know, it was just a I'll, gap. I'll one up you. I'll go one better on Ooh, this. On. I know that we we've commented before. Doctor Who's often lambasted for its production values. I, I think the colony sets are amazing. I think the the huts yeah. look great. The spaceship interiors look great. The, uh, the foreign city of the aliens. Everything looks fantastic. It's not until an actual native shows up that it's like, oh, never mind. Well, I mean, is it, it, it me or is the, was the foreign city reused for three doctors? Because it looks so much like that. It does look very it similar. It may have been. The walls do. Yeah, the car, yeah I, I was thinking they look familiar too. And I just think it's because I've seen this one a few times. But <laughs> yeah, actually, it, well, it's that too probably, but... Yeah, they actually might. They are definitely quite because they've got that sort of bizarre reddy gold kind of bubbly thing, haven't yeah, they? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Or they just thought it's a good design. Let's do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or, or it's cheap. <laughs> well, or in narrative terms, maybe they didn't really go to Exarius. Maybe that was just Omega toying with them. No? Ooh, the story just Ooh. jumped up 10 points. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. It's like, this, it's like the long game. As an episode at the time, it was quite like, ugh. But then when it came into the larger picture with the part of the way, you sound like, oh, this episode's actually quite cool because it all set in foundation for the finale. So maybe that's what they was doing with Colony in Space. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're giving them I mean, far I know too Glenn much credit. Uh, <laughs> it's a stretch, but, you know. <laughs> well, I know Glenn didn't like the spaceship shot, but, I, I, you know, that's the, the model shot of the spaceship coming into land, that's honestly not any different from what we've gotten from Doctor Who before. So, well, I, 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 I would, The explosion, I, the spaceship explosion was pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, the, the spaceship explosion yeah. was good. But I think they realized how rubbish the model looked, and so they were glad to blow it up. But I think the model work in Doctor Who has, has certainly been better, and I think that they got better with it as they do, because I think some of the best model work you maybe could argue is in a lot of the Tom Baker era. I think there's a lot of good model shots in that. This one just seemed really shaky and not really on par with what we've seen before. Now, granted we did get a rubber dinosaur the season before. And we, I mean, so there's, there's been inconsistencies <laughs> with the quality of the, uh, well, visual in this one we got the, um, live action iguana. I think it was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which, which, that perspective shot, which, which at least it's real actually works because when you first see it you think of how cheesy and how projected it looks but then yeah. it works because it is actually a projection <laughs> that's being put forth by the miners so that is true that is true i just looked up and cleaned my carpet and going oh it's this one again <laughs> i mean seriously i was cleaning my carpet to keep myself interested i saw you tweet that earlier and i thought oh gosh <laughs> and i wasn't making it up i really was cleaning my carpet <laughs> i was like well this is more fun <laughs> 
I think the thing that I, I struggled the most with was the little chatty Cathy doll with the prune faced head. I yeah, pretty I much th- all of the native stuff yeah. <laughs> I well, struggled with. I don't even I don't even think the design of the natives was that bad, but it seems like with every oh, whatever they mutations or every mm-hmm. incarnation of them, they were slightly worse. In fact, I think the little short kind of shorter prune fa- the larger prune face guys weren't yeah weren't true. as impressive and then suddenly yeah we've got the little tiny guy who's the you know speaks english and is the overlord oh, right, yeah. of everything yeah, yeah that was just that was pretty pretty bad they you know what's interesting and why like the... land of the lost rejects yeah but yeah what, what, what i think is interesting because you say about the design of it, it's quite good i remember you guys may not remember this because i don't know if you would have I don't know. Were you into the Doctor Who before, 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 back in the eighties? Yes, yes. I oh, yeah. I watched it. In well, the 80s. okay. Who so, did you get the novelizations prior to watching the episodes? Not many. Not for me. Okay. Well, I remember, for instance, when the Doomsday Weapon, which frankly is a much better title anyway, when the book of the Doomsday Weapon came out, and you got the cover with the Exarion on it, which I think is the one from the end. I think it is. I forget now, but it looked really good. On the cover of the master and the exam, right. you think this is really, this really good book, you know. And then, of course, then you watch the episode finally when it comes to video, and you're like, oh. great design, not wonderfully realized in actuality. Looks great on paper, literally. Looks great on paper. Uh, that's the joy of novelization. <laughs> well, that's right? just the thing. No, I true. think there's a lot of people that grew up in an era, and it's probably especially pre videotape that. They did. That was their first introduction to Doctor Who was through the yeah. novels. And, of course, Absolutely. your imagination is so much better than what can be put on television, especially in that era of television. And so it has to be a disappointment sometimes to go to these and go, oh, this is not at all what I imagined. Well, yeah. even to go one step further with the, the genius idea of making them telepathic. Because from a production, I was like, good, because that way the mouse doesn't have to move because that mask looks terrible. But then to bring the little <laughs> yeah. puppet man out and he talks and it's like, oh, why didn't yeah. you stick with okay. that? You could have just piped a voice in. Yeah. Hire Stephen Thorne and have him come in and do the voice. You'd have been fine. But... Oh, yeah, I'm the Xarian. Yeah. <laughs> that would be quite yeah, maybe. Yeah, had he had a deeper voice, it probably would have made okay. the entire thing a little bit better. <laughs> could you have really rationalized the... Uh, booming deep voice with the little tiny squat body i don't know maybe one oh, of would have made all sorts of know, Wizard of Oz jokes, that, but you know because yeah, i can't you know, it would be quite fun probably because it gets that it kind of follows the story of the idea of, well, in many ways the story is all about not what you perceive everything to be so maybe it could have quite fit this really weedy odd looking thing with a booming voice or but if, if it's, it's the, telepathic then why wouldn't it be booming well that's it's, true exactly if, if yeah. this is supposed to be the final incarnation of this yeah. mutation that they they went or, or i guess it's going backwards but it seems like either way if he's the 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 most recent version or the first version he should be bigger and more powerful and more impressive than the the warrior hunter class that's out there kind of roaming around in the wastes where the body's withering the mind's expanding so it being right. a booming power exactly. for it in the mind would probably have carried a nice bit of weight to it and god knows that story could do with a bit of weight <laughs> and that's just it if, if we're going to go there if we're going to set up this idea that maybe this is what's going on okay cool let's explore that give me a story that delves into this concept and the doctor trying to stop the master from exploiting them or whatnot this is as you said keith it's two different stories mashed together i would have much rather had a four-part minor story miners and colonists a four-parter there and then let's bridge that with the cliffhangers the master showing up on the planet and go into another four-part story that happens to be set in the same location, but now we've got all this other stuff with, with the, the alien race, and we forget about the, the, the miners and the colonists. Let's deal with the aliens that are the, the native inhabitants here and deal with that. That, to me, would have been much more interesting, and I think it would have worked better. This is one of the few that I'm actually championing for more, even though I said it was longer. I think if you have <laughs> broken it up and given me more parts to it, it would have worked better. But See, trying to do all of that in the six parts, but not really doing anything, it just felt like a whole bunch of spinning the wheels. I think yeah. if this had came out in the Hinchcliffe era, so obviously if, what, four years later, it probably would have been quite like that. The four part minor thing, then two parts doomsday thing. Because yeah. the six parts in the Hinchcliffe era, they realized the best way to do it, because obviously the length of it and cost and whatever is. We'll give you a four-part and a two-parter, 
and we're going to shift things around. It's still the same story, but different perspective, different location, different shift. Because Talons does that, Seeds of Doom does it, you know, and it really works well. Actually, Invasion so of what, Time does it. Yeah, Invasion of Time does do it, which is a very, oh, that's not the best example. <laughs> but it, well, I, I was thinking of Dinosaur Invasion then, and then I went down because I was like, oh yeah, yeah. No. I think Invasion of Time <laughs> does it in a slightly sleight of hand type way, but yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, you go into the TARDIS and well. Well, gosh. and the entire minor story almost feels like a, a precursor to a lot of the Fifth Doctor's era. Had you re edited that so you see the minors before the Doctor shows up, it could have easily been a Fifth Doctor story. Yeah, but one yeah, thing but is true. quite good. Again, I'm going to say something positive. Again, I don't think they planned it, but in retrospect, it kind of flows quite well. Because when I did the My Companions book, obviously, I had to look into all this stuff way too much trying to find sort of a through story for the companions and this is actually unintentionally probably the beginning of joe's real journey to the point where she leaves because of her eco warriorness because this is this story is in many ways about that kind of subtext you know the whole hippies versus the corporations mm-hmm. you know, that's, kind of yeah, that's the true. Clearest example of it in the poetry era which of course they come back to a few times so they were joe so in hindsight, although I'd not, I imagine it wasn't planned, but you can at least see it as part of jo- Joe's initial first steps to where she would eventually end up. So, see, we can find good stuff in this show. That's a really good point, Andy. Yeah, yeah it really is. Yeah. Well, I'm working it, my magic. Really. To that, to that point, it also gives Joe more character development in the sense that she's not, she's less of a lab assistant now, and she's now become mm. more of a a proper companion or, or, or working towards a common goal. So I think that, that this story does that for her as well. And what's, what else it does good for Joe, which, again, is unusual for the time. As I said, Joe starts off really scared, not wanting to be there. But then she meets um, Mary Ash. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Ash's daughter. Yeah, Ooh, yeah, 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 Mary. Um, and she suddenly realizes there's still people. And so it's a bit of development for her too she goes from the fear and like you know don't like this to oh the future is not actually that different scarily and people are still people uh, see one thing you guys wouldn't have got from this uh, story is there's two actors in this who are or at least were very big in to the UK's top soaps extenders and Combination Street so it's very weird like the one who plays Mary Ash she's I'm sure you know she's like been in College Street for like ever. So seeing her as a youngish girl from 1971, I believe it was, it's kind of distracting. Could you look at her and think, oh, that's what's her face from College Street? <laughs> you know, and then, um, you know, the, the bully um, by the ICM, what's his name? IMC. Um, the blonde dude? No. The other one. The one his soldier, basically. Yeah. The, the other face, uh, the, one, the <laughs> other one without facial hair? Yes, the, yeah. the other one, yes. Because <laughs> there's only two, aside from the doctor, that don't have facial yeah. hair. He later ended up in EastEnders too. So, again, it's quite, it's kind of, it's, it's historically interesting to see where the actors come from and see them in something else. But it's also a little distracting over here. Where I guess you guys wouldn't have that because you wouldn't know who they are. But I know you obviously get it, I guess, in US programs where there's, actors turn up in your favorite shows who used to who are so synonymous with certain soap operas or whatever and you're like ah totally threw me out of story right like say John Barrowman turned up in now and you're like no I don't buy him as a father of that guy no I don't buy that either. that's exactly that's a great <laughs> that's a great example because it took me a long time to accept John Barrowman as, as, yeah. as Malcolm in Arrow because I knew him as Captain Jack and so mm. it, it, he had to earn my appreciation for how he performed the character, and I think he did a great job. Ultimately, I... or, or or like John Cleese when he shows up in City of Death. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just basic, he's just basic, he's just playing John Cleese. He's just it, being yes. John Cleese, and that's it. He's just John Cleese, like oh, completely took me out of the story. <laughs> oh, I'm does. kidding. <laughs> I think it's meant to a little bit. <laughs> oh, since we're talking about some casting, we should mention that Roy Skelton is the the guy who was working for the mining company but pretending to be Oh, that's why I recognized him. Yeah. yeah. Underneath the all of the that facial Roy? hair. The voice well, of the Dalek's yeah. Roy Skelton. Yeah. 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 Wow. And Cybermen and all sorts of other computer stuff. 
Mm-hmm. And bungle and zip. I have to be honest. I thought that was the master at first, buried underneath that Bob Ross <laughs> beard, beard and, and hair. But I kept looking yeah. at him, going, "No, that's not." It's him. kind of weird to know that this is the first time you've seen this story. That's just that's just weird to me, man. That anybody's not seen this stuff before is just weird. <laughs> I'm almost well, there. there. Are several of them that almost there. Tracks. It's so weird. I, I as, as, we, as we said before, yeah, being on this side of the pond, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. you know, it was it, if it didn't show up on PBS, you didn't see it. So it's only in the recent. Mostly Tom Baker, yeah. wasn't it? Pretty much. Yeah. Well, even yeah. for me, who I think I've probably seen, I think I've probably seen everything at this point, and I'm seeing stuff for the second, third, fourth, fifth time. It's even with Sean being such the fan that he is, and he and I growing up in similar situations where we both watched Tom Baker yeah, growing up. He's the newbie, isn't he? He is the newbie. Yeah. And so, but even a newbie. <laughs> even sometimes. Well, not anymore, but. Even sometimes <laughs> Sean will shock me when he will say, I haven't seen this st- story yet, so this is new to me. And I think, wow. How, what? You know, because it, it, it's odd to me because I, uh, Sean, when we first met, had probably about two dozen Doctor Who stories on VHS because he worked at a video store and Mm -hmm. I that's how I filled a lot filled a lot of the holes in my gap as far as stuff that I see as I was borrowing these tapes from him and then years later we'll come across and he'll say he'll say well I haven't seen this short story and it blows me away because he owned it on VHS but he never watched the thing Because he loaned it to uh, me. That makes no sense. No. To me. <laughs> or you should see his DVD shelf. Yeah, They're if you saw his DVD yeah. pulled out I, that he hasn't but, seen. And even back oh, in the day, his VHS collection was massive. So, say in that mind, I may have a down, problem. I'm looking down my blue my DVDs because I keep buying cheap DVDs, and I've got hang on, one, two, about fifteen sitting that I've not watched yet. So, so see, it happens. It happens. Yeah, it does. Yeah. But I've got better stuff to watch, like Marvel and John Wick and stuff but i I, i'm not as so much as you andy because you certainly have seen all all of it probably even before i did but i i I find myself in that same situation where i think it's just amazing that it's stuff now sometimes i don't remember it because it'll be like six or eight years ago since i saw it Mm -hmm. but it's it it blows me away when i with sean when he's oh i haven't seen this one yet and he's surprised by a lot of it and i think well this is weird being the one with the foreknowledge (laughs) it's also weird for me this is again a bit of a the cultural the Transatlantic does not divide a little bit. Is that it's weird for me when you're saying like I don't I might have forgotten of this particular part of the story or some such. I'm like how oh, what, what how can you forget these things? Because again, I've seen these so many times yeah. over the decades, you know, because they've been on video since '88, I think it was when I started getting into it. So it's mm-hmm. you know it's a long time. It's what 30 years old. Good God. That, that's yeah. honestly the more surprising Scary. element is when we go back and, and watch or, or review an episode of something that I did see. Yeah. And, you and it, you know, an episode that scared me as a kid. Mm. And I'll be like, like, oh, I'm not looking forward to revisiting this because I remember being terrifying. And then I watch it now and it's like, oh. Yeah. yeah that, <laughs> that's scary. Why was I scared of that? <laughs> or things that I didn't think I liked that I've come back to and go, ah, that was a pretty good one. Why didn't I like that as a kid? Mm. So, you know, but taste that's, the, that's the beauty of it. Know. Yeah, absolutely. It's like Dinosaur Invasion. It had the rep for being so awful. It finally got to, gets released on video as it initially. And boy, everybody's opinion changed. You're like, actually, of course, the dinosaurs are atrocious. There's absolutely nothing we can say good about the dinosaurs. But the story and the performances and everything else is superb. Which you can't really say about Connie in space, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> Just to bring it back. <laughs> Was there any, anything else on Colony in space from anybody? I liked the end of it. <laughs> because it ended. Ding, 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 ding. That was awesome. The credits rolled. <laughs> it's over. Yeah. Um, and your carpet's clean Mike. now. So. Uh, I mentioned off mic yes, that yes. Uh, had I known that because this is Keith's last Pertwee story, he has now seen the entire run, and had I realized this one was of this caliber. I probably would have scheduled a little bit differently so that he could have gone out on a high note. So I feel I owe you an apology. Yeah, um, I think you do. Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe on the rewatch it'll get better. Let's when talk about it- Night of the Intelligence. Okay, what's that? <laughs> Do we have a blurb? Do we have a blurb? Oh, you've done that right now. Yeah. Yeah. already did oh. that. Right. Yeah, yeah, I remember. 
It's the Avengers of the Lethbridge Stewart verse. Oh, who said that first time? <laughs> that was Sean. That was Sean. It's actually you. Yeah. I yeah, that was kind of cool. I, I listened. I was like, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, but not in tone, obviously. You know, much more depth, obviously. But yeah, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a good way to describe it. It really, in hindsight, maybe probably should have been at the end of last year, so that this year could have started with fresh. That probably would have made a bit more sense in hindsight. Well, maybe. but did no. Didn't it fall? It's hard to, it's hard to tell because obviously I'm so involved in it. It's hard to be objective. So isn't this the 50th anniversary of the Abominable Snowman? No, it's not. What did you think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I lied to you. Yes, yes, it is. So yes, I think it's. Yes. I find it fitting that it did. I mean, even though it it ends up beginning this cycle of books, I think it mm-hmm. it works in that essence that it's it, it it's that tie that makes it appropriate. For this year's uh, novels. Well, it's interesting because, again, I, I don't want to give away too many secrets. But, for instance, Padma Zambavar's version, um, purpose in the role in the story, that was very late in the writing process. It literally happened in my head. I don't know maybe I was two chapters away from him actually appearing, and I was like, "Oh, well, I should really use him actually, since it's the anniversary. Let's go back to the beginning properly here," and. Unfortunately, that did mean that Tomney's role kind of diminished a bit. Because then I had to sort of readjust what he was doing in the story because he obviously still had to be there because he's on the cover. Um, but again, it's one of these things that I wish I thought of this before I started writing because Padma Zambavar would have been a much larger presence throughout. But then I actually go back and, of course, see the little bits. So from your point of view, it looks like he was always in it. It does. But no, he, he literally yeah. came into it right towards you and I was like oh yeah I forgot about him well, let's we, let's change that change that change that and make sure he actually looks like he's meant to be there because well, it would have been <laughs> I'm glad you do that because it does bring the character full, full circle because we don't hear <laughs> much about him in any of the, the material between then and now and so to kind of book end the arc with him I think that's <laughs> very appropriate well with Padma Zemba what, what turned out to be quite fun because I was I had to really wrestle with this, like the idea of using him. And when I finally thought, oh, I should use him, then I to, it took me a few days to decide whether or not to, because as the book just tells you, um, there was a real Padma Zambavar in Buddhist history. He was, you know, he's a real person, and he's supposedly the Buddha of the modern age. Um, so, of course, using him, and I'm like, well, I can't have all this Buddhist talk about the Padma Zambavar, the guru, and then have him appear later without connecting it together a bit. And then, of course, I'm like, well, that's a little... I've got to be very careful how I play that because that could really offend a lot of Buddhists that you're kind of playing with their holy figure. It'd be like basically having some uh, having a character called Jesus and actually saying he's the same dude. You know, you could offend people easily. Sure. So it was, it was definitely something I had to wrestle with because... As I'm not sure if you're aware that when um, Ten Sticks wrote the novelization of Abominable Snowman, because this was during the Purdue era when he wrote it, obviously he was good friend to Barry Letts, who was a Buddhist. Um, and as we now know, and as my intelligence illustrates, a lot of the names they used in uh, Abominable Snowman were based on real Tibetan figures. Padma Zambavar, Death Sen itself was actually based on a real person, and so on and so on. Um, and so he changed the spelling of these names for the novelization just so just to distance them a bit from the real people. So I had to decide myself, I'm like, look, there's but one, I have to use the spelling as Mervyn done it because that was his that was you know, he wrote it that way for a purpose. You know, I can see why Terence changed it, but I went back to the original because that's what Mervyn did. But then by doing that, I'm like, well, I kind of can't not acknowledge the connection between the real people that these people are named after. Like Tomney, as in the book, also reveals that there was another Tomney in his in Buddhist uh, history. So that became something I had to really, really think about because you could offend people, and you've got to be very careful not to offend, but at the same time allow for dramatic license to a degree as well. So. It's fun. I, I wish I thought. I wish I thought about it. that before, before I wrote the book. Because I would have done it much better, probably. But yeah. 
in a way that that kind of works that there's these shadows and echoes since uh, obviously hearkening all the way back to forgotten son we've got this idea of reincarnation of yeah. Yeah. the the intelligence wanting to come back and dealing with the uh, the the buddhist idea of um, the circular life and and trying to uh, you know return so in a way the fact that there was a pasma samava and now there's another one is kind of like yeah okay cool it's a little but, confusing, but you know, on, just on well, the surface, then, like once I you said, get into it, it's there. Yeah, and as you know, by the end of it, I do strongly hint that he actually is the the guru from Buddhist mythology, but he's much more. So right. I was thinking, instead of offending them, I'm going to actually suggest he's actually even more than they realize he is. So I'm just kind of saying, like, he's um, he's this this figure you think he is, maybe is much more to me, even you don't know yet. So, and of course it fits within Doctor Who because I don't know if you guys kind of got it, but again, it's, it's trying to play these things without spelling them out, but I did try to convey that maybe he's actually another version of one of the guardians of time. You know, you know you've got the white, black and various others. And I kind of, my suggestion, I was hoping trying to suggest that maybe he's one of that pantheon. Maybe. I'm not saying he is. But maybe. So, you know, it's fun. It's fun to play with all this sort of stuff. I hadn't thought of that. So, next time you read it, because I know you said you're going to reread the second half because you wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was that Keith that said? I'm sure that was you. No, it was me. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, I'm not rushing through it. I get a little classy. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the injecting of even more of the, the Buddhist history and, and mysticism into this book, because you kind of mentioned at the end uh, about kind of your journey and how people are able to, you know, the, the Buddhist idea of greeting death warmly mm. and your own journey while you were writing the book Talk a little bit about injecting sort of some of the Buddha uh, okay. ideas and things into this novel. Why? Because when I was writing the book, I dropped my panda. Yes, I have a panda. Not a real one, chair? obviously. <laughs> it's a um, sort of china kind of one. Anywho, when I was uh, researching, I was looking and reading up a lot about Buddhism. Cause it's always interested me anyway. And obviously I've been reading about it on and off since for Gone Son. You know, so... I knew this book, because of, it's like because it's now going to be the definitive story of the intelligence, not its origin, because that's still to be told in, in full. But it's certainly going to be a bigger exploration of what he, what it is, where it came from, what it means to various people, and so on and so on. I kind of like, well, I need to get this as close to various Buddhist traditions as possible, but without again being too specific, because there are so many traditions within the Buddhist faith, uh, belief, whatever you want to call it. And then, of course, you've got all the other stuff, like you've got the Vedic monks. Oh, stuff. I've got a book about them somewhere as well. Um, so I, I was trying to give it a more of a generic sense of the various types, as opposed to just, it's it's a, instead of the intelligence as a visual, visualization or realization of one particular branch of Buddhism, it's more of a realization of various aspects of. Because Real Buddhists, if they read this book, I'm guaranteed they'll really be like, well, that does, that, 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 that's this Buddhism, that's not this one, that's what you were talking about a minute ago, but that's a deliberate thing. It's not me saying I've not researched, it's just me throwing it all together. I mean, I mentioned, I think, that in the article as well, saying that. So it's a sort of an overview. But the whole death thing is, because I was reading this book, it's called The Tibetan, the, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Um which is literally written by this um, Buddhist master called Sogyo Rinpoche, um, which I still haven't finished because it's a hefty tome. But as I was reading it, more ideas come to me about, oh, I can explore that, oh, I can use this, oh, I can use that. And the idea that, and I, I firmly believe this anyway, and this just reaffirms my, oh, I, knocked, I dropped my first order stone trooper. Oh. Um... <laughs> Next time, we we'll get all these books off the shelf first. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, I've always believed, I've always found it amusing in a kind of like, I don't get why the only constant in this life is death. Literally, that's the only thing that you can absolutely be sure of. And as Anya says in Buffy, 
people are stupid because it's the only thing they know is going to happen, but they're always surprised and upset when it happens. And you're like, you know, that's actually spot on. We are. And of course, reading that book, the whole point of that is that death is the only guarantee. So you should be not aiming towards it because obviously that's just kind of morbid a bit, but certainly embracing it as the ultimate. Because if you, I suppose, if you believe in the Buddhist way, then you know death isn't the end anyway. It's just the end of this particular path. And then you move on to whatever's next. Because if one thing we know for sure, I don't know whether you guys believe or not, but all throughout the world, there's most beliefs believe in there's something beyond what we are now. And I, I like to believe that's true. And I don't necessarily ascribe to one particular belief, but I think, yes, there's more to it. So that's one thing I kind of wanted to explore. Because, I mean, reincarnation is a, it's a, it's a thing that has run through Doctor Who since the 10th planet. So it's definitely something consistent with Doctor Who mythos. And indeed, Buddhism has run through Doctor Who since Earth's era. So, again, well, actually, since the Royal Snowman, actually. Um, so... <laughs> It's, an, it's nice to be able to embrace it a bit more and just talk about it a little bit and share some ideas because I think in this past year, as I'm sure you guys knew from um, Ashley Inferno, like last year, this young guy in New 16 died. And so I just see it the way that his death affected so many people on so many different levels and it made me reassess a few things a bit. So this kind of helped in that. So I figured, you know what? Hence, you know, I brought him into this book again because I keep doing that now. And I thought it's a nice way to maybe just make a little bit of a difference. Although I would say left with Stuart, just like Doctor Who ultimately is, you know, it's pulp fiction, really, ultimately. And these books will only have a limited lifespan. But it doesn't mean you can't try and do and say something with them. Or now, you know, you know, a few decades down the line, no one's going to care. But it doesn't mean you can't try and do something and say something. So, yes, that went a bit deep, sorry. <laughs> um, well, oh, I, 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 I just sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, you, you, reincarnation. I just want to, and this just to lighten it up a little bit. Um, you know, in the I forget which chapter is, Miss Anne talking to um, Tomney about reincarnation, and she can't quite. Remember. And then he's explaining to her how you know reincarnation is a pretty normal thing, and he uses the doctor, of course, as a good example. Of reincarnation and that was me 100% talking to certain fans and readers who passed a few interesting comments about forgotten sign about reincarnation being a part of that book and it's so not Doctor Who I'm like what it's it's 100% I mean doctor, doctors reincarnated every single time yes and a very Buddhist way, actually, because he becomes a completely new person who is informed in 100% by his previous life but every time he's a new person, and that's very Buddhist. So I made a point of putting that line in because I wanted those people who said that back, you know, two years ago now, to say, look, actually, think about it. You know, the whole reincarnation of Doctor Who is very much a Buddhist thing. So you know, it's been there since 66. And I hadn't thought of it until you mm-hmm. connected it. And I thought, oh, mm-hmm. wow, what a revelation that is, because, yeah, that's absolutely right. I think the other thing that I think the reincarnation and the, and the Buddhist mysticism does in this book for me as a reader is I've become very attached to Professor Travers and yeah. sort of seeing the writing on the wall over the past several stories that he's obviously nearing the end of his life, that he's going to be passing on soon. And for us to be able to deal with that, what I think <laughs> in this way. I think works on a much better level that Anne gets to have that conversation and see more than she would see just having a conversation with him on his deathbed. And I think the interjection of that idea helps send Professor Travis's character on. And I think that Mm -hmm. works real well. Yeah, that was, uh, again, it's a bit hard to work out. Had I more time and more words and whatever else available, I would have done much more with Dead Sen. I would have actually gone to Dead Sen, but you kind of have to cut these things down a bit because obviously time is what it is. Um, but having Anne go to Tommy and speak to her father and stuff, that was pretty much there from the beginning because that's like, it needs to be. Because this all comes from a simple logistic thing of Travis is obviously one of our licensed products. 
um, or characters. But he's also a guy, an old, very old man, who quite clearly is not all there by Weber Fear. Very old, very doddery, and there's not much you can do with him in an action type series. So I'm like, I need to basically get rid of him because he's going to hold the series up just being there because people can be expecting him to appear. So I was like, we just need to put a line under that and done with it. But like all the things, I want to make sure it's earned. It didn't just happen. So him going was always the plan. It just needed to be planned, you know, happen more organically than just boom, dead. But then, of course, as I'm sure some people will point out, but nobody has yet, to me at least, but he's alive in Invasion. <laughs> hmm. How does that work? Well, you definitely laid the groundwork at the end of this book. I know, because <laughs> this is the funny thing, because I know you guys mentioned that, that she has that sort of, in the astral plane, she has that vision of the future where him and Anna are in America, like Invasion says, and now we know why they were in America. However, he still dies at the end of this book, so what? And even Anna hasn't quite clicked yet. Hang on, I've saw the future where he's alive, but he's, hang on, but it hasn't even occurred to her, because obviously she's a bit in grief and whatever else. Yeah. But I imagine it will occur to her at one point, she'll be like, hang on a minute, what? <laughs> so she can speak for the fans and she'll be like, but but he's alive later. What's going on? But hang on, what? So it's fun. I like to play around with fan perception a bit. <laughs> yeah. I know, obviously, I've got a plan. Obviously. I wouldn't have killed him off without a plan. Or would I? <laughs> How much of uh, Simon mm-hmm. being uh, 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 Simon uh, Gore, how much of that was part of the plan from the get-go? Was that character None loaned out? No. No. This is the interesting... Well, when um, Simon, as he was originally, was completely Rick. He, you know, is a, is one of the very few original characters that Rick had throughout his own book. Well, actually, he sort of disappeared the halfway-ish, I think. After yeah. the hospital thing, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but... The, it was during the writing that I said to him, I want. I told Rick I want him to basically work for the um, vault. But we hadn't decided who he is or whatever else at that point. But before the end of the book, I did say to Rick, I'm like, I kind of, like, I've got a feeling I want to make him the general son, just for the emotional twist of it when it all comes out. And Rick was like, I'd rather you didn't, but obviously it's up to you. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> that's unfortunately how it works. I mean, unfortunately for the other writers, not for me, obviously, great for me. Um, <laughs> so I did for a long, it wasn't a, like Blood of Atlantis, we sort of suggested again, Mind of Stone a little bit, um, but it wasn't until I think Mind of Stone when Gore turns up towards the end with the whole Johnston thing that's basically when I thought actually yes and it it does make sense of what's going on it certainly makes sense of the connection he had with Owen because it's only almost a filial collection because in a manner of speaking in this really complex way Owen is a reincarnation of Simon's own father it's quite. <laughs> I've created this very complex relationships with these people, which is fun for me again. For the other writers, I don't know if they think it's as fun, but well, it's I certainly like it. it's certainly fun for the reader because it's it gives those little uh, twists and turns, and it really mm-hmm. makes you as a reader think about this whole overarching view of what's happening yeah. and where you've come from. Well, it's it's fun because what I like. Like I mentioned on Twitter, I mentioned it earlier, I'm liking the immersive nature of this entire series, the whole interactiveness of it, not just with the readers and fans, but also with the other authors, because they all bring something else. You know, that's why, and another reason why I said Night's my last one, because it's fun when others bring stuff to me. I know where I'm going with the series, and I do. I know where we're ta- I mean, obviously we're taking up to Invasion, and I've got the main beats of how we're going to get there. But, like with Simon, somebody could bring an idea to the table. This character, Simon, not Simon the writer. Um, you could, they could bring a character to the table, and then it would sort of just change a thought in my head. I'm like, ooh, actually, we could play it this way, and it will still fit the main 
generic beat that we need to hit, but in a different kind of way. And of course, the consequences will then be slightly different, but they can still go to the same beats ultimately. It's kind of like, I suppose, composing music, really. You know, you've got your core beats, but then you play around the medley and everything around it. So, and I like that. I like that. I like the interactive nature of it all. As I say, not just from the writers, but from readers like yourselves, as you well know. There's much times you said stuff that I've listened to on the podcast. I'm like, ooh, that's it. <laughs> I'll just pretend I always had that in mind. Um, and I mean, like, you know, because I know we're going to get onto it tomorrow, so I'll make it a nice segue. Like the prologue, for instance. So how much of uh, how much did my dropping a piano in the middle of your orchestra disrupt things? <laughs> Way more than I was comfortable with initially. Because you may remember, and now this is going into some stuff, you may remember when you first said it to me, I didn't respond to you straight away. Because um, at first got I was like, oh, this is so not what I was expecting. Not necessarily in a bad way, just like, this doesn't really fit my plan. And I'm like, oh, crap. But he's done it now. I don't want to be horrible and just totally rewrite what he's done. I can't just dismiss it because that's just not fair. Because you know, we've all built up a good relationship, so you know you've got to be fair. And I'm like, Ugh. but I knew I had a little time between that and actually writing the books. So I'm like, okay, let's. I'll take put it aside for a few weeks, just let it fester in the back of my head, and then I'll come to it fresh and see right how can I play this out. And you know, as it turned out, the thing with Natasha. See, the biggest problem I had was, as I told you, you brought the Russian thing into. It. I was like, why would the Vault be using Russians. I'm not. I didn't get the logical there, as you, you know, as I explained to you. And so I said, okay, how about if they're not actually Russians, they're just pretending to be. So it becomes part of the story. And then of course she gets all that. Oh, I can't bother pretending to be anymore. So it becomes a bit of a thing, as opposed to a complication. Like I always say to people, I keep saying this to Sean um, Russell, and I say it to the office all the time: is whenever you're presented with a problem when you're writing, you instead of it consuming you and you're thinking crap I can't get out of this it's a case of how can you make a virtue of that or a complication whatever it's like how can you make that a virtue of the story or the virtue of the series whatever so your short story which became the prologue of course was I'm like okay what's, what core elements of this can be made a virtue in the long run like um, obviously Natasha became quite a good thing because I instead of her being Russian once I decided she's worked for the vault it became much more connected with Gore and his search for the intelligence because she became a tool of that, so that actually worked really well. Um, the actor Young Crystal, which you didn't you didn't name, of course, in the story, but I knew what you was getting at straight away. I was like, the Blue Crystal, oh, oh man, damn it. Ah. And then, of course, I had enough. I thought, oh, actually, that will fit really well with what I'm going to do later with Travers. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> so we'll make that a key point of the story later on. That actually works really well. So it's taking what you gave me and thinking, okay, how can I use these things without totally disrupting my overall plan? So, but then, as I said to you earlier about the whole copyright and naming stuff, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to call it Acti on Crystal because that's more generic than Metabili 3. Um, but people who know will know what they refer it's referring to. And, of course, then I got to play with the idea that, of course, James is from a parallel Earth, so he's already seen these crystals from a, a different, you know, his alternative version of Earth, which has had a version of Planet of Spiders happen to them, you know, so you get to play these different riffs. But, yeah, that, to as I said, the crystal was not part of the original setup with the chamber and all that stuff, but when I reread it, I was like, actually it works really well in context and gives a bit more grounding for it and indeed made Natasha's role bigger as a result too. So you could run to your friends and say, oh look, she's still in the book! <laughs> <laughs> I am totally going to mock your review now. That's great. How much of it in the writing is because you know so much of what's happened that you're just adjusting based off what other authors have written or how much of it is you helping shape what the other authors wrote to fit what you were going to do? Uh, I'd say probably 50, 50 actually. Um, as I said, I know roughly where I'm going and don't, and of course, as Sean's obviously realized by now is that when I give authors ideas, like I want a book about whatever. Um, but I also then give them a little list of, but you need to include this, 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 this. 
often not that many, but sometimes it needs to be because sometimes it gets a bit involved. So, but then of course they'll write it, and they may not necessarily get what I meant properly at first. Obviously, they don't know the big plan, but they got enough in there for me to then slightly edit and trim so it fits better the long story. So it's fifty-fifty. But then, as I say, like with Rick when he created Simon, like um, <laughs> like looking at the tiles here, but like with um, Blood of Atlantis and Mind of Stone, not intentionally planning this at all. It just didn't quite. Because in, it's it's like as you know, in those two stories, both of them deal with sort of intelligent rock, in two consecutive books, which is not the sort of thing you would plan to do as an editor. Because that's just <laughs> not very clever. You know, you're not going to repeat the story, are you? That's just dumb. Um, however, because of the way Simon writes, because he just gives you a general idea, because that's just how he writes. And because with Simon. Since he's read so many books, I'm like, that's okay. He had much more latitude than maybe somebody else would because he's got the backing. I knew he sent me a basic idea. I let him run with it because I know that he'll be okay. Whereas other people, I need a more fuller story so I know I can help guide them. Um, so I knew what Ian was doing with his Mindstone type thing. Indeed, we give him the title of Mindstone. I keep doing that. I keep giving my office titles. I don't know why they put up with it. But honestly, <laughs> every time in the series we've given them, it's awful. We've got to stop doing that. It's like we gave Sean his title. <laughs> um, it's what I do. I assign titles, write a story around that. Um, yeah, so I knew with Mind of Stone, for instance, it was all about this Mind of Stone, which may or may not be Castrian, as in uh, Mad of Fear. Um, and then, of course, Simon's telling his book about the rock and stuff, and I was like, ah, whoops. We now got two books. That don't deal with sort of sentient rock. What is he? But since Simon delivered his first, I'm like, in that case, I'm going to have to adapt uh, the next book to fit the former book. So, yeah, it's it. And then, of course, I made it, again, a virtue of Mind of Stone that that's exactly why Anne was called in, because of what she experienced in the mm-hmm. previous so she's got the knowledge, a basis of knowledge that she didn't have before. So you make it a virtue. So people bring their stuff in. I will adapt it. Sometimes they'll bring an idea in which just doesn't work at all for the ongoing arc. And then it's like, well, this just, it just won't work. It's just not going to fit. But if it can fit, I'll find a way. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. So as I say, 50-50. We mentioned yeah. last week about how this particular story really kind of elevated all the way back to schizoid earth for us uh which was that was david uh, mckinty is that correct so how much of that alternate earth influenced what you did with james or general gore in this particular book how did that how much direction did that shift for you as when writing this book well after schizoid earth i've i still kind of wanted to a story set just entirely in that version of reality. Literally a story that's just with those alternate characters. Um, but Sean isn't convinced that it's strong. it would be strong enough for just general readers. Because obviously it would be a different version of Leffert's jokes. It would be the um, fascist kid who gets corrupted by his father, all this sort of stuff. That's, I always wanted to do that, but it just wasn't happening. Um, but I've always, no, well, not always, in after that life. The first time the general mentioned was, as the general, was in Scripts Side Earth as well, of course. So we've, we've seen James doing his thing, Major James, as it was, but we've already heard mention of the general. Um, so the original plan for the general, and this is the first time I'm telling anybody this, so exclusive, the reason the general was going to be Johnston, not Gore. That was original intent. It wasn't until, indeed, the original version of Mind of Stone was being written with Johnston as the general. But it's only when we realised that Skits on Earth just wasn't working as a sequel independently that I was like, well, I still want, and then I said, for actually, let's make the general his brother, because that's just nice, the dichotomy of that. But not his brother, too. And of course, you know, because he's had his whole thing for the last year or so for him, not even a year yet, um, where he's never quite believed that he was in this alternate universe. He believes it's all this drug-addled thing. 
Um, then he gets confronted by this and it sort of really messes his head up a little bit, as we now know. So, um, yeah. Is that your question? Because I forgot yeah, what the no. actual question was. <laughs> just, yeah, no, absolutely. I've been on a talk show. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> so this was sort of your way to to delve more into that Infernal Earth idea, but put it in the perspective of the Lethbridge Stewart universe yeah. that's already been established. It's basically it's me getting to do what I kind of wanted to do, but in a different way. So that's why I throw quite a few hints of what's happened for him in between. Oh, not too specific, but enough. So when I do get around to telling the story, hopefully, we can then join his dots together. You get a fuller story of you know, how he came to be this person that he is now. And, of course, we did have the odd way of doing it by having him die before he was introduced, which is quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'm, not, I'm still not sure if that works, having Ashton of Ashes of Inferno released first. Not, I don't know. I'm not sure if that was a smart move in hindsight. Well, at least from my perspective, I look back now at Ashes and so many things click now. It's like, oh, okay, this is where this comes from. This is why this is here. This is why they already have this relationship in Ashes. And so that works retroactively with that story. Yeah. Well, this is a thing because I put these little clues in Ashes. And then, of course, I had to reread this when I was doing Night to make sure that what I was doing with their meeting still tallies up with ashes because I couldn't do anything in night that would end up contradicting what I now establish is happening which is what I keep doing to myself I keep <laughs> the story set in the future and so and so has happened it's like oh this is going to have to happen now um, so yeah it's 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 fun it's, it's complicated but I enjoy it it's okay I don't mind. I'll do you one better as I was reading um and so caught up in the ending of, of how things were, we were rushing toward this great finale mm -hmm. in night. I was quite astonished. The general didn't die. I kept waiting for him to get killed at the end of night of the intelligence. And it wasn't until after I put the book down and man, that was great. That was, fantastic. I wonder why this, Oh yeah, he's in ashes. <laughs> and it, it took me a moment, but I had to go back to that when I go, Oh yeah, he's still around. So it, there, it, there, there's a few different endings for it, actually night for, the general and indeed for that character um that smith person the one who's investigating him there's a very few different permutations of how that was going to play out so he was never going to die but he wasn't going to get off as well as he ended up getting off so good for him bad for the left Stewart. <laughs> but what i did actually do definitely intentionally which i don't know if i know one person picked kind of fell for it so if, if it works on one person then I've done my job is that you may recall in enfolded time when they have, before the brigadier goes off and meets the accord he's having this conversation with Bill and they mention Owen uh, Owen the paddy's in some sort of coma because of something that happened in the past and we don't know what's happened but Owen's in this really bad state and so I deliberately at the end of night when he goes off in the astral plane and he's in this, apparently he's in this coma and Simon's waiting for him to come back. And so I did deliberately, in that, those last few scenes, I never followed that up to let people think, oh, is this where he goes into his coma? Oh, no, no. So when you get a code open, or left Stuart gets a knock at his door, he opens the door. It's not till they speak, you realize it's actually Owen to come and see him at, right in the epilogue. So then you're like, oh, phew, he's not dead yet. <laughs> and I know at least one person fell for it, so that's okay. There was one person got hoodwinked then my job's done <laughs> so speaking of hoodwinked uh you want to explain your tweet about major bartlett <laughs> okay 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 were you just trolling glenn at that point a little bit Let's, uh, let's let's set this up real quick. Point? Let's set this up because if, in case somebody didn't listen to last week's show, we had talked about how I had gotten a tweet that major that I wasn't going to like something that Andy was doing with Major Bartlett in the story. The character who's named after you. Yes. And you, you become this conglomerate. The two, three of you, is quite fun. Um, yes. Um, and I've got to remember what was my plan I think I was going to kill him off originally so it wasn't me it was partly trolling but part of me was like I was, I was writing the actual um, earthquakey thing at the time and he was going to get killed at that point 
But then, of course, I started thinking, I was like, actually, no, you kind of need to get Miles and Bart together because there's a lot of fun, metatextual sort of fun for me to play with, For obviously for you three. Nobody else will get it. But as long as it works in the story, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but you guys will get it on a different level, whereas the readers will just read it as characters doing what characters do. But for the meta joke to work, killing them off just wouldn't really have done my... would have got to play out my joke. Um, so... That's why I ended up basically giving him a, basically throwing him out of the truck, spraining his ankle, and he gets taken off mission for the entire book. It's like, ah, oh, man. So, yeah, I was going to kill him, but it just wasn't going to work for what I wanted. And I got a feeling, but I may be wrong. I didn't have time to check, but I've, I'm sure he's mentioned later in one of these short stories that's set after. So, again, I'm like... Am I contradicting myself? Oh, okay. <laughs> so make sure I'm not. I know that Captain Miles, or Lieutenant Miles, right, left him. Oh, no. he's, mentioned, he's mentioned in Ashes of Inferno. As right. well, I have it because he's one of the guards at the Project Inferno when, when Durham Leffishire takes James there. That's where he's first mentioned. So I knew he would have to be introduced at some point and become a lieutenant at some point. So, yeah, it, it's fun. I like um, teasing people. I will say I have never been so invested in a peripheral character <laughs> until that point, and not even so much that he has my name, but because of that tease. And I thought, okay, this is it. This is gonna. This is gonna happen. And then he's serving tea, and I thought, oh, okay, so he's he's poking the bear here. He's having a little fun. Okay, maybe that's what he means. And then only to put him in the harrowing situation later, and I thought, okay, this is it. This is where he's going to die. Oh, he's just got his ankle. But I would like to thank you for that roller coaster ride of emotions. Absolutely welcome. I can't promise not to do it again, but if it is a short story, obviously. Um, Yeah, it's fun. So the only person now to appear is, of course, um, Sean's namesake. But soon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a bit ominous, wasn't it? <laughs> um, I can say his name check will come up sooner than he does. So watch out for it. We're leading, and of course, what's quite fun is his character is very different from Bartlett and Miles, and he's not a nice guy. Not a nice ah. guy. Oh. Ooh. Clues. <laughs> he's not a good guy. Um, but yeah, he's definitely. Although he was meant to appear next year, but that's been put back another year, so it's gonna be a while. But he'll get there. He'll get there. And he's been mentioned before, so it's not like you know. Yeah. And you did get to write part of my book, so you need to run the house, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm the bad guy in retaliation for that, right? Yeah. That's... yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, you're done to my short story. Kill, kill, kill. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to ask you here. Um, was the intention of the wiggle room between the end of this story and downtime intentional <laughs> or not? Because that was one of the things that I appreciated, that as this story arc has played out, there are there have been clear indicators that you weren't entirely beholden, beholden to what happens to the characters in the future in downtime. Yeah. But I have always managed to see a way around that and how they would work because, you, you know, I love downtime. Now, <laughs> you bit. did leave a do little you, bit of wiggle room. You? <laughs> you did leave some wiggle room at the Never end. Was that, in- that to me. <laughs> Was that intentional? Just say no. yes, Andy. Absolutely not. Um, as I say, when I heard your review last week and you said that, I was like, that's so not what I meant. But <laughs> it, I can see how it works. At this point, but of course, there's lots to happen yet. Uh, but at this point, I can totally see how it, it'd work. But no, because um, there's, there's a few reasons why downtime is not necessarily apocryphal, but it doesn't necessarily fit what we're doing. Because I, I'd have to rewatch it or reread the book, whichever. But I seem to recall it being very clearly the third attempt of the Great Intelligence. It didn't allow for a anything else between web and that as i recall that, that again that's like, certainly it's true. been a long time since i've watched or read it so i couldn't but i'm pretty sure that's how i remember that there was no 
there was never meant to be a gap in terms of the intelligence striking for a time, um, which obviously would limit us enormously because half of our licensed characters are in that story. And if we were beholden to everything happened to them in that, we would never get to do anything ourselves. <laughs> so um, it's not to put the story down, it's just pure logic that it just wouldn't, it would constrict us too much. But like I say, from what you were saying, yeah, I can see how that would fit. And you're welcome to think that for now. But I guarantee <laughs> later you'll realize you are incredibly um, misjudging this. But you shall see. Um, as I pointed out, of course, Travers is definitely dead. He's dead. There's no two ways about it. Um, he won't be coming back. He is dead. However, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it still leads to discontinuity of invasion, but there's a solution which we are working towards. But Travers, as we know him, is absolutely... That was the whole point, is that, as they suggest at the end of this story, we confirmed later in another book, um, they're going to basically fill the vault level four with concrete so that the intelligence and it, which is obviously at the moment apparently stuck in Travers, or at least grounded by Travers, will not be able to escape. So, and it will be confirmed later that they did indeed fill it up with concrete, unless they are lying to people, which is definitely possible with a new person in charge. Um, <laughs> so, as far as I'm concerned, Travers is definitely dead. And he, but it's science be fiction. Fine he off can doing his thing. But yeah, I mean, no one's really dead in sci fi if you really want to. So, what you're but saying is I'm there not- is room out there for a short story <laughs> that wouldn't necessarily fit in the entire narrative, but could maybe lead a reader to believe that it's possible that the great intelligence got out of there before the concrete came in and maybe made his way to Dead Sin. Because now, if you look at the bar, the book that Mark Platt wrote, it is mentioned in there by a character that it was thought that Travers was dead, and then he shows up again. And the Travers that we get in downtime isn't necessarily the Travers that we know from the past. And it, and I think there's a spark of possibility that the, the, the great intelligence has been there the entire time, and it has been putting on the airs of being Travers. So I'm just putting that out there, you know, do with it what you like, but... <laughs> yes, yes, Glenn, yes, Glenn, yes, yes Glenn. He's going to do everything he can to make it fit. I'm making a note now. Right? Don't do this. Don't do this. Really remember, him up. Really remember, hard. I'm the guy yeah. that tries to make all those 1960s Doctor Who comics work in the continuity. So I'm going to do this. That's fine. Well, this is why with these things you kind of make it. Hello, buddy. I kind of, you know, I like that people try to make things fit. I've got obviously my idea of how things fit or not, but. I kind of, you want to leave room for interpretation, you know. But like I say, as far as I'm concerned, Travers, as we know him, is dead. But I have got my backdoor plan, which will happen as soon as it is. It's going to take time to put in its place, which will explain how Travers is somehow still alive in um, Thingy, in Invasion. So that may well fit into your theory about Travers in downtime. It may not, <laughs> or it will if you wanted to. You know, it's entirely up to you. So They'll find a way to make it work. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's what it's all about. You know, at the end of the day, because so, there's so much other media, Doctor Who beyond TV, that for it all to really fit is, you know, you have to bend and stretch and ignore bits if you want it's like the whole unit dating thing isn't it you know i do know a guy i do know a guy who did fix the unit dating thing with one uh pen to paper so i I think it can be done yeah is that sean (laughs) (laughs) no it wasn't me Uh, (laughs) not not that talented or brazen (laughs) um no as i always say with the unit because we never really talked about that after did we um with the unit thing I always, I always said at the end of the day, I think the solution is the fact that it doesn't fit. That's the solution because honestly, it doesn't. There's no way to make it all fit because every time somebody comes with an idea of, oh, it fits because of this, it fits because of that, they're almost certainly leaving something out which doesn't fit with their plan. So See, I'm that's, like, well, that's how Travers is still alive and in New York. It depends yeah. on which dating protocol we're going off of. You know, it's- and that's why I'm all very. Uh, I think the whole fact that unit dating doesn't fit is kind of the whole point. It can't work, you know. 
which is of course what Inferno Time is all about. Now, I do have a few other points I want to raise since you might have forgotten them because you may not bring these up. You had an issue, kind of maybe ish, with the whole Sally Evans thing, right? Sort of issue. Can it was the, kind of it, the relationship okay. between the two. I think that what yeah. we had pointed out was that it felt, I don't want to say forced, but it felt like maybe it was a contrivance a little bit. Mm. And so I think okay. that's where we went with it. Okay, well, I can reveal exclusively um, that it was our plan from very early on for these two to be related. Um, hmm. But as I, as you know, the Evans thing wasn't working in terms of the series, so he kind of got pushed away. So that kind of took a back burner. But then because certain people really enjoyed Evans when he appeared in the short <laughs> stories, we suddenly thought, well, actually, let's do a novella about Evans instead, and then we can finally get that story working again. Hence, Life of Evans. So, you can say that you guys are almost certainly responsible for Life of Evans being a thing. So, Yay! Yeah, that's, that's true because of your review, and every you can't, you know, and a few other people were like really receptive to his appearance in those Christmas stories. I'm like, yeah, okay, 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 cool. Um, so that brought the old Sally Evans thing back. So I thought, well, let's just do this. The reason why, and this is a purely meta thing. Is because, and it's to, it's partly to honour the actors who played, or the actor who played Evans. Uh, I forget his name now. I forget. But anyway, this actor, he appears later in Doctor Who and the Silurians as a character called, as I recall, Sergeant, possibly Captain Wright. Oh, now, yes, 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 yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit meta, but the whole, in, because. I hear there was an interview where apparently he asked, when he was doing the re um, rehearsals, he asked whoever, can't we just make this Evans? Because it'd be quite fun if it's just the same character. But obviously they said no, because I guess cock, right? Um, and when I heard that, I thought, ah, but we can. <laughs> <laughs> we can infer it at least. You know, We can set up that maybe somewhere down the lines, is a, at some point Evans takes on the name of his half sister for whatever reason so eventually so it actually is Evans in the Solar Ruins so for fans you got again for Glenn type people you get to fit things together <laughs> and it's like hey, it's all connected. I like it I so, like it so yes it's all connected but not in the necessary sense of all the characters are connected just for the sake of it but more for it's more of a for, for the fans kind of thing really so if you want to believe that it kind of we give you the back ground for it to happen so that's why that came about so um i'm sure there's something else oh yes do you want to bring this up the whole Anne and bishop relationship thingy yeah we, we you brought it up at the beginning of the podcast and you said we were going to revisit that when we started talking about the book so let's go into that because we have well, sort so of we have sort of yeah, shipped Ann and and bill we know that there at least is a a building grounds of a more deep and more romantic relationship between the two or are we going to get something from that well i'm going to say absolutely because obviously in for instance the enfolded time the bishop talks about his wife and of course they call her Anne. so we all know it's going to happen right. and i believe in at least another one of short stories it's Pretty clear. I've seen the two brigadiers. It's very clear as well. I don't know if you guys have read. Playing Dead is the other one. We did. We did read the two brigadiers. Yes, Playing Dead, of course. Which, interestingly, sidestep the Playing Dead will make so much more sense to you guys. I know you weren't overly impressed with it, but it'll make much more sense when the next novel comes out for the first batch in this year, second half this year, which is the New Unusual, which is Adrian Sherlock, which is set just a few days before the plane dead so suddenly you'll make much more sense to you oh okay oh, okay good and indeed the next novel dreamer's lament will give you a reason why this whole zombie thing was a concern of these characters why these aliens were able to pluck this from their head so it it does all fit eventually just you know even if you read stuff you think hmm, okay stick with it because i'm sure they'll explain this later <laughs> and if I don't, you'll mention it in podcast, and I'll make a note of it to do so. So it's all in there. <laughs> well, so, yeah, I, 
Yes. That's certainly one of the fun things about the Lethbridge Stewart series is that we get these little interludes, these little short stories, and sometimes they seem to be their own thing. I mean, these standalones, yeah. and then suddenly there's a payoff later in a novel, and I think that's a lot of fun to see the payoff. You know, going all the way back to you know, Plain Dead or In Full Time, in Ashes in Inferno. All of these things that finally play out later, and there's that aha moment. That's what's so much fun about this series. Well, what I kind of like doing, I kind of, I don't, I get, well, I guess it's working because you guys clearly enjoy it, so I'm assuming that others do too. I kind of treat Left with Stewart in many ways, certainly with short stories, the same way we treat Doctor Who now in that we often have stories set in the past that make sense of a future sto- uh, story. Or we'll have a, they'll have, let's like, say, Big Finish will release a fifth Doctor, whatever, which will explain a discontinuity from a first Doctor story or some such, you know. Um, or you have, I don't know, say, a fifth Doctor, Doctor Who TV story where something happens and you're not quite sure if it makes sense, but then they release a short story from way, way, way before, which then retroactively explains why that makes more sense now. So I kind of treat Left Stewart the same way in the sense of, yeah, I'm giving away certain plot points and, in effect, locking myself down to certain things happening, which is always a risk. Um, but, as you say, it gives you guys a bit of like, huh, so at some point this is going to happen, which is apparently five years from where we are in the novel. So I wonder how it's going to go from there to there. So it, it's I can see how that's, you know... As a reader, I'd enjoy doing that too. Like, hmm, how does that fit? Well, does that help your road? Does that help your roadmap too when you're plotting this out to go? Okay, I I put this here. I've got to get from point A to point B. Does that kind of help helps. or is that hinder? <laughs> I don't know if it helps exactly. Um, it certainly locks me down sometimes. Like um, the thing we sent you earlier, which again we can't talk about just yet. Um, I'll mention it to you once we've signed off. Um. In that, for instance, there's certain things happening because it's set in 2017. There's certain things happening in that which I've got to make note of because I'm not really overseeing that as well. I'm overseeing certain elements of it. Um, I've got to make a note of it so that, again, we don't contradict it in our series or later on and so on and so on. So I, I don't know if it's helping, but it's certainly making my job more difficult as we go along. But it's my own fault. Because I'm the one who keeps on doing it, so you know, it's like um, you know the the uh, a history books. Don't know if you've had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, the dude who's he's putting together the latest ones and stuff. He, you know, he's still doing stuff. Um, and he gets free cop or you know, free PDFs of all the books, so he can obviously make sure he gets the entries in in time and da 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 da. And he has said to me a few times because I'm because I don't know how you do it, man, but. The, the coherence of this series, short stories and everything else, it's, it's amazing. I don't know how the heck you managed to keep this all straight in your head. I'm like, oh, it's not all in my head, I assure you. Um, <laughs> I've got so many notes everywhere. I mean, let me just get, I'll show you this. You won't, don't read any of it, but you can see it. This thing, for instance, on my wall up here. Oops. Slightly ripped now. This here, don't you see it in that light? Yeah, kind of. Oh. This. <laughs> Yeah, you got a bit diagram Stewart, there. Yeah, it's the Left with Stewart family tree, uh. <laughs> and there are people on here that you've never heard of. Um, you know, you've got his father, his mother, his um, his mother's mother and father, his father's father and mother. You've got his father's brother, his mother's sister, her husband, and uh, you've got his father's brother's family, and you know. It's complicated, but obviously when you reveal it bit by bit, it doesn't sound so complicated. But it's all written down. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's... I can store only so much in my head at one time. <laughs> well, the very I don't know, scope I, of the stories you tell, I mean, to make them all fit, you'd have to write them down. You're not wrong. I do... I, I <laughs> See, I think people think I'm just vain because whenever the books come out, I end up sitting there reading them. And they probably think, but you've just been working on those like a few months ago. You know the story. It's like, yes, but I need to keep putting the stuff back in and back in and back in and back in because a few months ago I was working on this book, but I'm now three months later on the next book or for three books down, and that stuff has been shunted aside a bit because obviously I need to focus on what I'm doing now. 
but at the same time, I need all this stuff back in there because it's all connected, it's all linking, and I need to keep reaffirming what I know. Because like you say, it's a lot. And it is, it's, when I look at it on a shelf, it's like there's, what, so far, 12 novels, three short story collections, one novella. It's a lot. To keep it is. It. As a reader, I want to thank you guys. Hit, see? <laughs> As a reader, I want to thank you guys for uh, promoting and continuing the short story. Um, in today's market, there doesn't seem to, publishers seem to think there's not a market for short stories, and with the exception, unless you're, you know, Stephen King, uh, who can kind of get away with it because of who he is, there's not a great push for something like that. So when you guys, you know, oh, it's a short story, I, I love short stories. I love reading them. I love writing. Them. I love everything about the format because it's one of those you can work on it and it's a nugget of an idea and here it is and it doesn't need to be any longer than what the the, the story it takes to, to tell it and so the fact that you guys have sprinkled these throughout the you know these little interludes throughout the bigger adventures in the novels it makes it fun and as glenn said it, it little little pieces that wind up coming back and being a payoff later it just it, it really helps that you know because not not every day when you go to work do you wind up fighting off an alien invasion well, Sometimes it's the pickpocket on the corner, and so those little yeah, things that you have absolutely. to deal with that in, in that maybe or maybe not play into something later. It's just wonderful. So I really appreciate it. Well, the irony of all this is that we did not plan on doing short stories at all. <laughs> it's just it was just a complete convenience that we needed because I didn't know you guys at the time, of course. But when, as you, I, I assume you know, there was a huge gap between the console and skits on the like almost a year gap for various unfortunate reasons. You, you, you know, there's always rubbish going on. Um, but of course we had to in that gap, always trying to get Skits Under together. We need to keep the interest going because you're like, we just launched our series, we've got a huge gap. This could totally ruin the series before we even get started now. So we had to keep interest, had to keep interest somehow. So we kept doing little short stories free. Here's a free short story, here's a free this, here's a free that just to keep the interest going, which, as it turned out, worked, thankfully. Um, but then we created almost a tradition before we even got to the second book of <laughs> doing short stories. So we just kind of had to keep going with it. And now it's become this thing where, you know, literally every novel comes out. I, I guess people are expecting a short story to materialize with them because it's become almost a traditional thing that we do now, which is fun. It became a problem, obviously, as we know, because we suddenly ran out of people to write them. So we did an open story submission, which really, really worked very well. So many. <laughs> oh, man. We got so many submissions. Oh, I say we. <laughs> I have, of course, mean me. I'm not allowed to go through them all. Um, yeah. I still haven't gone through them all, actually, in fairness. There's, there was a lot of them. But I've told people, I'm like, you know, we've, we've, we've commissioned that for this volume now. But, and if you're listening, we will get all your stories in time. They're all there in the emails, and they will go through them in order of them arriving. So it will take as long as it takes, but we will get through every single one of them and say yes or no, or whatever. But, you know, we only do, what, four collections a year, so it will take time. Yes. Well, we're uh, coming up on a almost three-hour mark here, I think, although some of this has been just kind of <laughs> us jabbering. But... Um, I did want to ask, is there anything else that we didn't touch on that uh, yes. you needed to bring up or um, you wanted to bring up? Actually, I do want to bring up one thing. More for the viewers. viewers. <laughs> it's because we're watching each other. Um, more for the listeners, really, than us. Is that cause you, you touched upon this a bit last week about the bias. And I made a note saying uh, your bias. It, doesn't, it looks like bras. <laughs> no, seriously. Look, 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 look. It does like look like bras. bras. <laughs> it's actually bias. I was looking for what's that? What's that? Bios, bras, what? Um, in that, when it's all started, and it's an, it's an important thing to reaffirm, I think, to people is that when it started, because it can, I think, it could easily be perceived as we're just constantly praising each other. Um, but when it's all started, I didn't know any of you people, and you didn't know any of us. You know, um, and it's only because I happened to, I think I upon the review of Schizodurf, possibly Forgotten Son, I can't remember which one it was. I think but it was, I just happened to. I think it was Forgotten Son. Forgotten Son, yeah. yeah. 
I think it was the spoiler version of it. Yeah. I forget. Yeah. And it just, I just happened upon it, you know. And then, of course, you kept doing them, and then we got in touch, and it just became the thing that's evolved. So I think it's important for us, you know, for you guys and for me to just let people know that, you know, this wasn't always a planned thing. It's just something that's organically grown, you know, your involvement on the periphery of it, or not so much sometimes, and vice versa. So I don't want people to think that we're all here just a self-loving thing. You know, it's absolutely just purely coincidental that it's just part of the process, you know. So I think it's important that people know that you know, this wasn't planned. It just happened this way. Well, we've certainly because enjoyed. And here we are. We've certainly Never enjoyed the journey. My work. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've certainly enjoyed the journey, and I think it's made it that more special for us that we've been able to be involved mm. so much with this. And we've always said that we want to be as brutally honest with the things that we review. Well, we don't want to go in with a bias. A, and, yeah, and this is another point I think that you mentioned last week about you're not always, you know, you're you're not always up for everything we've done, which I think is again. A, very valid point is there's been some stories that you've not particularly liked certain elements of stories you've not particularly liked and you've said so you know it was if this was just one of these um oh what's that thinking word a mutual admiration club yeah <laughs> love um, fest no uh, <laughs> what's it when you like hire your wife or something what do you call it oh nepotism. Uh, yeah, yeah nepotism. nepotism it's not a nepotism it's it's you know it's just it's honest you know like you if you guys don't like something then you are absolutely free to say you don't like it and you know if I agree then I might take your opinions on board if I don't like oh, so wait until I get it right um, <laughs> but what's quite cool is your reviews generally are pretty honest I mean I'm just looking on the shelf I can see loads of books that you were elements you weren't too keen on like look at Moonblink I remember your thing at the end about the, the switching of the bad guys and now you're like they should have just kept the one in there and I'm like yeah actually you're probably right I should have done lesson learned you know so it's it's it's, it's good you know uh, well, and so we yeah, always we always seem to hope that you'll take the criticism constructively and maybe you know work towards something different or counter us and say, well, no, this is why we did it this way, mm. and you know always you know maybe convince us on your side of why something yeah, went a yeah, direction yeah, it sure. did. I mean, are you guys? Even last week, I can't remember what it was, but there's a certain thing you said, I'm like, that's not true. Okay, that's fine. But that's your perception of it, and that's absolutely fine, because that's what's all about interpretation, isn't it? Uh, I know you've said something about various books, and I'm like, oh, they obviously didn't get what I was getting at. But that's, again, okay, because if, if it's just all, it's all amazing, then... Where's the fun, frankly? Yeah, you'd get tired of us if, tired of us if that was the case. Oh, mate, this is, <laughs> I honestly, as much as I loved your review of my book, and it was a little bit embarrassing at times, like, okay, you're being too nice to me now. Um, I don't think I could take that every month. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be stuck in the doorway, man. <laughs> my head won't fit. So, but yeah, it's cool. I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to say about the next book. Let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, you're not writing any more yeah, Lethbridge Stewart, with the exception of you've got a uh, Day of the Intelligence plan that'll kind of give us some history. But um, Which, Jack, you may have mentioned it, we've had to, um, uh, there's had to be a slight sh a scheduling change on that one, is that the next novella out will actually, it's actually going to be the Travers and Wells thing instead. Okay. Do you Scheduling conflicts. I've got other stuff that's come up, but I've had to put day back. It'll, it'll get out then. It's just not going to come out next. So we, so that still people still those who bought their free novellas still get the free novellas they paid for. It's just instead of day it's just going to be doing the Travis and Wells thing first instead because these things happen unfortunately in the scheduling world. Um, but you know, obviously we want to make sure that they all still get their book they paid for. And to be perfectly honest, I think the Travis and Wells is much better bloody book. <laughs> Only because I've not read the Dead of the yet, so I can't really compare it. But yeah, uh, but, but anyway, you're so, you, you're not done with Lethbridge Stewart line, right? You'll still me, be a managing no, editor, no. right? That's actually quite funny. When I announced this, you guys got it, but a few people they're like, ah, "What? You, who's going to do it no more? Is it going to be no more Lethbridge Stewart?" Ah, panic, panic. Which was a nice response because I'm like, "Oh, it's nice that people care enough about the series." So that was cool. 
But that, what I literally meant is that I'm doing no more. I may do an old short story, perhaps, maybe. I may not need to because we've got so many people doing now, so that's actually good too. I mean, like a step back and just do the overseeing, the editing and stuff, and then get on with other stuff that I want to do. Because I've got other writings I want to do that's not Doctor Who related, not left with Stuart. That Although, le- of course, yes. That leads me into my next question. Do you have yeah, other projects that you have that you can tell us about that, that are coming up that are not necessarily left with Stuart? Not that I can tell you about. Not that no. you can tell us about. <laughs> <laughs> I have one project coming out that you guys know about, which I can't talk about, but you know what that is. Um, but I can't talk about it yet. Um, well, I'm sure we'll be the first to know when you can talk about it, though, right? Yes, I when you can mention it. Um, but obviously, people know, but only people I know who won't tell people because that's how yeah, these things work. You know, you get you, know, you get perks, as they say. Um, but yes, I, as you know, I've got this one project, just, but that's done now. You know, that I did that ages ago now. That's where it feels ages ago anyway. And that's coming later this year, but I can't talk about it. But I suspect. Well, I, I I may be wrong, but I I imagine it will be announced next month, based on the schedule of these things. I think, but I might be wrong. It may be a bit later, but when it does, I will let you guys know because it's kind of cool and it's quite exciting. Um, and I've got other stuff planned next year for the same thing. Got to be very cagey, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking in code. Well, that's okay. We, we don't want to step on anybody else's but, toes. You either, know, because so. you, you know what I'm on about. I've got more of this stuff coming up next year, so that's also going to be pretty awesome. But the stuff I want to do that's not Doctor Who related, because you know, I, I'm, as much as I love Doctor Who, I want to do other stuff. Now, like, for instance, I don't know if you guys are aware of this book. <clears throat> it's quite a hefty tome. It's a chunky book which I wrote a few years ago called Seeker. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yep. Which is, it's a vampire, Egyptian mythology, supernaturally, real-worldy kind of mix of genres that I like to do. Um, and we are going to be releasing, re-releasing this with Ken Jar soon-ish. I say ish because you know when these things are going to happen. Um, and this originally came out in like 2011, so it's been a while. And it's only recently that the ebook of it's gone out of um, license. But like I said to somebody the other day, it's been selling non stop since it's come out. Not like hundreds of copies, but it's still constantly trickling. So, what we're going to be doing is eventually releasing this through Candy Jar, which means if enough people are still interested in it as a book, I finally get to write part two of it. Hey. It's a four book series. And so after seven oh. years, I'll be up, I know, right? After seven years, I'll be able to write book two. And there is a lot of people who constantly badge me on Facebook and Twitter and who see me in Cardiff sometimes. When's the next book? Yeah, I know. It's only been seven years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that they still want it is good. You know, you think after seven years, they'll be like, yeah, fine, not bothered anymore. But they clearly still want it. So that's nice. But there's other stuff I've got to do. I'm a book that I want to write, which I'm not going to talk about yet because I've only just got the idea and I need to let it ferment a bit. But I just want to do lots of non Doctor Who Left with Stuart stuff because, you know, I love Left with Stuart, but obviously I've been doing this for, well, it only feels like two years for everybody else, but for me it's three years and it's almost been almost non stop every day for three years, almost. And it's, you know, you can, I don't want to get burned out. Sure. You know, not to sound horrible, but I don't want to become like certain Doctor Who producers who just become burned out and just do repeat, 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 rinse, repeat, re- you know, I don't want to be that person. Sure. So, you know, that could mean anybody. <laughs> um, Jonathan Turner. Well, for instance, <laughs> safe, safe one, yeah. Um, but he, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a, and it's not just Doctor Who, it's anything. People, you do the same thing constantly. You're going to get burned out. You're going to start repeating ideas and the product will suffer. So I need to, for the sake of the series, really step back from writing as well. Because the problem is when I'm writing it is that then, of course, I can't focus on the editing the way I would normally because I'm too big involved in the writing of a book, which obviously takes up a lot of energy um, and time. Like, I know that I feel anyway that 
the next two books in the series have suffered a little bit because I was doing Night of Intelligence because I wasn't as focused as I would have been normally. I mean, hopefully it doesn't show, but I know, for me, it felt like they suffered because I was, my, sh- my focus was sh- kind of not where it's supposed to have been. So, yes, that's basically why I'm doing it, not because I don't want to write for it, just because I need to do other stuff. Because, you know, shockingly, I have many other interests. <laughs> <laughs> not many people know this. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So. So just for the record, coming up, we've got uh, Daughters of Earth, you got Daughters of Earth by Sarah Cronin. I can't think of it remember now. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> I learned this. I learned this. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah. See, it's not that so is. easy. It's not and so easy. And I got it right in front of me, so it makes it even worse. Um, Wagon? Is that it? No, it's Chronovision, oh. I think. Chronovision. Chronovision. W is a, is a V sound. Okay. Because of she's from, well, she's from Australia, but people are from. Not Portugal, somewhere like that. I forget now. But either way. Um, so yeah, so that, ow, that's next. Um, Foreign Doors Worth. Foreign Doors Worth, you've got The Dreamer's Lament by Benjamin Burford Jones, which is actually quite good now, apparently. Um, <laughs> well, I say apparently, because you know, when you get so involved in it, you kind of lose your distance and you just don't know if it's any good anymore. It's like Nerve Intelligence, you know what? It's not until Will went through it and edited that I really knew if it was any good. Obviously, I thought it was, but you get so involved in the process, you're like, you lose your objectivity, you know. So when I say, apparently, I mean, like, well, people like it. I don't know. I don't know, because all all I know is what I went through putting these things together. So I can't, it's all a jumble in my head. So, yeah, that's fun. Bit of advice. If you love something, don't ever do it for a job. (laughs) Because the love becomes a chore. And suddenly the passion becomes a chore. And eventually you're like, That's why we're still amateur podcasters. Enjoy it while you can. I don't don't, don't, don't know. This this is kind of a chore. (laughs) (laughs) Believe me, editing this show is no picnic. Oh, oh, yeah. Speaking of editing, since we are running so long, and Sean's going to have such a task in front of us, we probably ought to wrap up. We started at, you've got to keep this bit in, Sean, because it's quite funny. We started at 8 o'clock, no, 7 o'clock my time, rather. Although I think we've probably started about half past 7 yeah, by the yeah. time we got right, right. right. half hour worth of pre- it is now five past ten my time <laughs> <laughs> it is now dark outside. it is no, dark right now I noticed in your little picture window it's, it's just you know, and Andy looked like he was in a room now it looks like he's on some sort of uh, special effect because it's just Andy <laughs> with a black box behind him <laughs> so yeah night has fallen here so Sean What's what do that? we got coming up on the schedule well, if you are so inclined, next week for Friday Night Who, uh, Tom Baker, the brain of Morbius, again at our new start time of 10.30. Andy, I'm not sure what that is for you over there. Uh, for us, it'll be six hours later, so we're talking about two in the morning. Yeah. No? Four. Th- almost four, yeah. It's 3.30. That's either an early this morning or a late night. In. This is why I don't tune in. Like, <laughs> I'm not getting up for another two hours yet. <laughs> that, that pesky time vortex. I just can't... Yeah. Uh, um, but we're going to be watching that in preparation for our show next week episode 342 will be our thoughts on uh, uh, some 8th Doctor Big Finish stories we're going to finish off season 2 with number 7 Sisters of the Flame and number 8 Vengeance of Morbius Uh, we get a little new who on Friday Night Who the following week with Christopher Eccleston in the two part Aliens of London and World War 3 and then our show the following week we will finish off the 8th Doctor or start the uh, Ace Doctor Adventure Season 3 with Orbis which kind of is a concluding chapter to uh, a, a three part thing and then we'll delve into some Titan Comics uh, with the Ninth Doctor uh, his Season 1 stories we'll be doing uh, issues 1 through 5 and reviewing that on the cast and uh, then some more I've stuff got on six, the I've got 6, 7, and 8 here oh, I'm enjoying oh, you I've only got, I've only got 6, 7, and 8 <laughs> <laughs> almost there 
All right. Well, um, of course, you can find us at TravelingTheVortex.com. And while you're there, please consider becoming a patron of the podcast. Uh, on the right side of the page, you'll find a button that will take you to a page where you can support us on Patreon. And the amount is welcome uh, from anywhere in the world. 100% of those donations go right back into this podcast. Also, there are links to retail sites there as well. A portion of those proceeds go into this show as well. And you can purchase pod, uh, podcast merchandise from our Traveling the Vortex store. Uh, you can find a link, all of that, on the website as well. And, of course, you can also reach out to us on any form of social media. We are all out there. And Candy Jar Books are available through their website. Go check them out if you haven't. Yes, I'll put my thumbs up. I'll <laughs> <laughs> see me. All right, fellas. If that's going to do it for this week, until next week, I'm Glenn. I'm Sean. I'm Keith. I'm Andy. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Be seeing you. Ta. I like that. Ta. Ta. (laughs) That's Andy's new sign off. Ta. Ta. Oh, no. Ta. -ra. Oh, ta. -ra. Ta -ra. Oh, I even like that better. Ta. 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 Ta Ta You have been listening to Traveling the Vortex. Doctor Who and all of its associated programs are owned and trademarked by the BBC. No infringement is intended or implied.